the uh, July 19th meeting of the SCAPRA Planning Board will come to order, please. Um, we all rise for the Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Doreen, will you call the roll, please? Rachel Hendrickson. Here. Rick Munking. Here. Roger Bealey. Here. And Jennifer Ladd. Here. Um, we have received a resignation uh, from the planning board. Russell Scudder has, uh, was the first alternate, has resigned. There is um, some severe illness in his family. Uh, Russell has not been with us long, but he was already a very good contributing member of this committee. Uh, that leaves us with two vacancies for alternates. I also have to uh, also make one other announcement. If anybody in the room is here for item nine that has been tabled. The first item on the agenda is Ventanove Holdings, LLC, requests a site plan review for lot 48 within the Innovation District subdivision at the Downs, Assessor's Map U, 53, lot 48. Can I interrupt for you? Do you want to do the minutes? I'm sorry, yes I do. Um, and I missed that. Approval of the minutes, may I hear it for the uh, June 7th? May I hear a motion? Uh, so moved. So moved from Roger, oh, second. I'll second it. <laughs> Rick Meinking, uh, any comments? Yes. Go ahead, Roger. Um, I was reading it and apparently I, um, I questioned something that Rachel, did you read that? And I don't know what I what it was. It's just a um, just a statement. I missed it. It was Toadie's minutes. Oh, it was Toadie. No, no. All right, we'll blame Toadie. No. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, it's just it's just, just, it's just it, it, it was under um, shoot the second the second item. In fact, it might have been. I'm, I'm not sure which item was, but it just it's just a sentence that says. Roger Bealey um, and a question Rachel, <laughs> which is never happens. <laughs> Would that it were so. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I really don't recall, Roger. So um, okay. if you question me, it was in the, uh, in the line of asking a question about what I had said. Well, maybe Doreen could check that. It's the one you just sent out. Um, if you need to see that as an amendment, we would have to table these until the next meeting to ensure that it's been checked. Whatever is appropriate. It's just dangling there, you know, it's just left there. It's Let's let it dangle, okay. um, if it's all right with you. And I had a correction uh, on page two, the paragraph that starts with, in response to a question from Hendrickson about the buildings being similarly uh, and actually, what I believe I said was similar to those already built. Any other? Can I see? Uh, yeah. Any objections to that as an amendment, Rick? Oh, I don't see any problem with that amendment. Uh, I was wanting the floor when you're done. You've got it. I was not here for that meeting, and I'm not sure if it's the first meeting I've ever missed, so I don't know if I vote on it or not uh, on the minutes. So there might be a problem if we only have three voting people, if I don't vote. So we might have to table these till next week, or t next month anyway. I think you still could um, hold the vote. I can abstain, you can right? Abstain. You can abstain. But would you? That would only give you three votes. But yours is an abstention. You've you so the majority. It would so still work. Still okay. I just want to make sure they could get passed tonight, or they would have to yeah. be on next. That's no. all. Thank you. All right. Uh, a motion uh, to accept the minutes as amended. So moved. 
Roger moved. Second. Jen seconded. Call the roll, please. Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Rick Menking? Abstain. Roger Bealy? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Thank you. Now, now we can move on. Roger. Unless I've missed something else. Um, the event of Holdings, LLC. Ready for me? <laughs> Jamel? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as a reminder, this project's located on Lot 48 in the Innovation District, um, at subdivision at the Downs. And the applicant's proposing a 27,940 square foot building that will consist of two to three tenant spaces for light industrial use. As previously, as previously discussed with the applicant, uh, the site plan review ordinance requires no more than one full service driveway, except for when an additional driveway must be provided to prevent traffic hazards or congestion. The applicant's formally requesting a waiver um, from the standard and has noted that the northerly driveway will be utilized primarily for truck traffic. Um, and the southerly driveway will be utilized for employee parking. So as requested, the applicant did provide two conceptual plans uh, depicting a single driveway along Center Street. So the applicant should be sure to discuss these plans with the board, and the board should be sure to provide direction uh, based on your comfort. And staff does continue to recommend additional windows or fenestration elements within the portion of the elevation facing Center Street to provide some, for some more visual interest when viewed from the public street. And staff continues to recommend uh, additional buffering along the southern parking area, uh, given that the project's uh, close proximity to the Dukas construction uh, project to the south. I think at this point, Angela would like to touch on stormwater. Um, last meeting, um, when we discussed this, we talked a little bit about the stormwater scorecard as we go through the innovation district. I have had a chance to talk with um, Drew Gagan from Goral Palmer about that scorecard, and we're still trying to work through some of the details of that and making sure that we have the details, I think, associated with it. I, I know it was, it was supposed to kind of function similar to our, our traffic scorecard. I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, so we do, um, I did reach out, we talked about setting up a meeting next week to kind of work through that. So I think staff is comfortable um, that we can get to all the information. So I, I don't want to hold up the project because of that. Um, but there is still some work to do, I think, as we move forward through all these site plans. The other piece, um, Jamel and I had a chance to do a site visit out at Innovation um, District this week. And one of the concerns that we continue to bring up is as these lots get developed in the Innovation District, the property lines, depending on who comes first and how they drain, right next to another lot. Um, this is one that has uh, Dukas Construction is right next door and how that drains um, onto the property line. They are, as they should, um, grading into what's existing grades there now. Um, I think if we get there tonight with any kind of progress moving forward with this project, um, I would just like to see maybe some more detail around that to make sure it drains properly. Um, this is something new and I haven't had a chance to talk to. Well, I did talk to Nancy actually when I was out on the field. I called her. We, we talked through a little bit of things out there. So um, again, that's something that we could work through. Um, I don't think it's anything that would hold up the project. It's just more information that I think staff is needing for both of those items. Thank you. Uh, Jamel, did you have anything else? I'm all set. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and for the applicant, Nancy? Um, Madam Chair, I need to share my screen. Hopefully I can do that. There we go. <laughs> OK. Hopefully everyone can see that. Can you all see? Perfect. Um, so as we had noted, we were here uh, at your last meeting uh, to present a proposal for a uh, proposed 20, uh, 27,940 square foot building on what is now called Lot 48 of the Innovation District. 
And uh, we, we had a good opportunity to speak to you folks about some of the uh, comments that were received uh, prim uh, uh, initially during the meeting, and we've responded to those as part of our package, both at the staff level and as a result of the comments that you folks had at the last meeting uh, as well. So one of the things that uh, was brought up, and I actually borrowed this rendering from Keith Smith, so you can thank Keith for that. Um, but I'd like to show you sort of uh, the overall setting of the site. This was a question that I believe some of you board members had, sort of how this piece fits in. Now this is not the entire innovation district. This is just around us in our proposal uh, and the, the driveways and points of access immediately adjacent to our site. So here's our site, if you all can see it. Hopefully the mouse is still following along. So this is our site proposed here. This is Center Street. This is the Ducas Construction Building. They are located to the south of our site on Center Street. Their point of access to their site is down here, past the divided section of Center Street. The lot 51, I believe, is the lot number that was um, fairly recently approved on the opposite side of Center Street, has its driveway connection here and on the north end of their building right here. This section is, has some wetlands in it and there's no curb cuts along this section, nor are there any curb cuts up in this corner here uh, for the site that was approved uh, in this corner location which actually has its access off of Innovation Way. This is Innovation Way. This is the Score Builders building located here. This is their point of access into their site with their parking down in this lower area here. This site right here is a vacant lot on the corner of Immersion Drive and Innovation Way. This site here is the building that was recently approved for Euphoria LLC from Mainly Tubbs. This is their building. They have access to their loading in this location and they have access to their site on the north end in this location here. Our northerly point of access onto Immersion aligns directly opposite that. In this corner here is the Zoom Drain site uh, that was approved uh, for the applicant last year. Uh, their building is under construction here. They have a point of access onto the end of Immersion here and a point of access onto Immersion in this location here. As you know from our last presentation, we are proposing a connector, an internal connector, to tie into this site that would allow us to have access onto uh, immersion from the south end of the site as well. In your application materials, we have a proposed cross easement that benefits the applicant's lot 48 and burdens the applicant's lot for zoom drain to allow access and parking for these parking spaces that benefits this property and that is shown as a draft in your application materials. One of the comments that we did receive from staff was to actually show the location of that easement. There's a graph, a graphic depiction of that in the easement draft and we would provide that on the plan uh, so that it would show that easement area uh, benefiting this lot. <clears throat> so I think that's a good um, sort of overview to kind of give you a feel for sort of what's happening in the area, um, how things are, are looking circulation wise. And I know that that was something that uh, the board had uh, questions about at our last meeting and hopefully that will help to shed a little bit of light on things. And I do appreciate uh, Keith putting that together for us. <clears throat> the, one of the big issues that came up uh, as a result of our last discussion was the points of access onto Center Street. Quite a bit of discussion uh, evolved around uh, our request to have two points of access uh, onto Center Street and we were asked to provide some graphics that depicted what it might look like uh, if we were to consolidate and only have one point of access onto Center Street. So we provided two alternative sketches which are in your packets. The first one is this one, uh, Alternative A. Uh, it consolidates all of the points of access to the uh, northwest corner of the site. That allows a truck coming into the site to access the docks 
and to access the docks from this location here and to exit out onto Center Street. But it also puts all of the passenger vehicles that would be parking and using uh, the um, parking spaces and access to the building on the south side of the building. If you recall in our prior plan, <clears throat> we did not have any parking across the front of the building. That was a large uh, expanse of green space. With the consolidation of these uh, two um, driveways into one in this location, what has to happen is we lose parking that had been in this location here in order to make that maneuver to come around. So we also lose it in this location here in order to provide access into the site. So in order to recoup that, we do need to provide parking between the building and Center Street. The number of parking spaces that are shown on this plan is identical to the number of parking spaces shown in the plan that we do propose, uh, which has two points of access on Center Street. So we have not added any parking spaces. This is just simply to recoup to get back to the original uh, number of parking spaces on the site. There is additional impervious cover on this site, and it actually puts us over the 80% threshold uh, for impervious cover on the lot. With our proposed plan, we are below the 80% threshold. It gives only a little bit of a sliver of green space between the drive aisle and the backside of the sidewalk. This green in this location here is actually the esplanade along Center Street. Um, so one of the most uh, telling things with this is with regard to vehicle maneuvering. This is a fire truck that would have to make this type of a maneuver in order to get into the site. That fire truck crosses wholly into the oncoming lane and over into the bicycle lane in order to make that 270 degree turn uh, in order to get into the site. This is not a trailer truck, this is a fire truck that would need to come in to be able to access the south side of the building. In addition, because of the configuration, there's such a short distance between the back side of the sidewalk and the necessary edge of pavement. The concern is that vehicles coming in this location would not have the ability to make a 90 degree turn and then turn in. So they would be tempted to make sort of a diagonal crossover uh, in this location here. Another point of concern uh, for access and safety at a consolidated combined uh, entrance. So the next thing we looked at was what could we do to elongate that so a vehicle would have the ability to come in, begin to straighten, and then turn coming into the site. So this is alternative B. It has similar uh, situation where we do have to provide parking along the uh, front of the building. It does have an impervious cover limit that is in excess of the 80% threshold. And we have, in this case, parking right up against the back side of the sidewalk in order to accommodate um, vehicles which would now be parking facing Center Street uh, right on the back side of the sidewalk. A fire truck making this maneuver is a little bit better. They're not in the bike lane, but they're still in the oncoming traffic lane uh, on Center Street to make that maneuver. This maneuver is slightly better for passenger vehicles coming in, but again, we feel that the safety implications of putting all of that traffic in that northwest corner of the site is not something that is a preferred approach uh, for the design, and we feel that the program that we are proposing with the two distinct and separated points of access alleviates congestion in this location, allows for safe vehicle movement in and out both for trucks and for fire apparatus in both points of access. So we do still respectfully request that you consider granting <coughs> a waiver on uh, the two, uh, a waiver to allow, I should say, two points of access onto Center Street for this particular site. Uh, so with that, I wanted to uh, again move on to a couple of other items that were highlighted in the staff notes, and I just wanted to let you folks know how we've addressed them. So let's go. Can you all see? Let's do it. Stop sharing that, and I'll do the architectural plans. <clears throat> so these are the architectural elevations of the building. A couple of comments that were received from staff um, before we, we uh, uh, presented our 
response to comments, if you will. I wanted to show you how we had addressed those. Um, <clears throat> the comments that were made with regard to adding additional um, architectural features along the Center Street frontage has been identified and included in your package with the accent panels on what would be the northwest corner of the building, similar to the accent panel that is on the uh, northeast corner of the building um, by Immersion Drive. The dumpster area, as we mentioned in the last planning board meeting, that dumpster area has been uh, screened in and enclosed with panels that reflect these panels shown on the site plan, on the uh, building itself. So that ties in and provides a nice uh, visual screen uh, for the dumpster area itself. We have, since our last presentation to you folks, we have coordinated with the uh, police department on the street numbering uh, for the site. It is 30 Center Street. Uh, this building has its address on Center Street, but with there being two suites, what we've shown is the Center Street frontage has 30 Center Street Suite A shown on it. And we're proposing, <coughs> excuse me, although it's hard to see in this rendering, a Suite B uh, sign here, which will direct uh, folks coming to the site that this is where to go to get to Suite B, which has its door here. On the side of the building that faces Immersion Drive, we do have the signage similar um, with the whatever tenant logo might be on there uh, for that. So we do have signage, <coughs> excuse me, at each entry door. Um, one of the comments that came, and Jamel just uh, referenced it as well, are uh, with regard to <coughs> um, this wall plane right here. This wall sits back about 180 feet back from the main uh, front wall of the building, which is this face right here. And the concern had been <coughs> whether to add windows in that location there. Um, the rendering has been updated to actually reflect the canopy tree, the um, Princeton elm tree that is located uh, in this island area, which had not been included uh, in the prior rendering. So we wanted to kind of highlight that it is landscaped in that area. And as we mentioned uh, in our last presentation, that section of the wall is in the warehouse portion of the building where uh, windows, <coughs> excuse me, would not be advised. Keith Smith has uh, more information to provide to you with regard to uh, the landscaping, some placemaking additions that uh, he has done for the site as well. And uh, <clears throat> so in just a moment, I'll turn that over to Keith and he can show you uh, his information. So I just wanted to also highlight for you folks, uh, this is the floor plan, nothing's changed on that, but the elevations have been updated as requested uh, to provide the material colors for the fascia and the metal canopies, the wood in the uh, visual panels and the siding colors are all shown on the elevations, which was a recent staff comment that we received from you folks. The other thing I wanted to note uh, on these elevations, and this was a comment that actually came from Wood and Kern in their peer review, is that in the prior elevations, the dock areas were not correctly shown as the four foot height docks, which they are uh, in this location here. So these are full regular docks, and that has been updated on the architectural excuse me, on the architectural plans. We do have ad grade doors here and here on the building, but these are full four foot docks uh, with the dock appendages. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to Keith because I think I need some water um, <clears throat> so that he can show you, I'm going to do a new share. <clears throat> Water. Good evening, uh, Keith Smith, Landscape Architecture. Um, so thanks for having us tonight. Uh, what I'm gonna do is highlight the changes to the plan first, um, and then I'll go over uh, the, some of the staff comments, and then I have some images to show to kind of help give some context as to what the landscape will hopefully look like. <clears throat> 
So the first change, we talked about placemaking last time, and, and there was a discussion about this space right here um, where there's a door that enters into the building um, that allows access to both sides and that this potentially might be a nice place for, uh, for placemaking. Uh, so you can see that there's a, there's a square space that kind of at the intersection of the two sidewalks, <clears throat> uh, it's 12 by 12 space. Um, it's provided with two uh, solid granite benches um, nicely located below the elm for shade from the south um, and surrounded by the wildflower mixture, uh, some red twig dogwood and some ornamental grasses around the building. So uh, we think that's you know nice peaceful gathering space uh, that's provided for conveniently for both sections of the building on the site. Uh, the second thing I was going to talk about is the um, a transformer pad um, in that location. Actually, R Richard had commented about not getting too many shrubs close to it. So, so with that, I actually revisited and, and found that I was encroaching on setbacks of the, uh, the transformer. So I actually lost one of uh, the viburnums here that I took out. Um, that it didn't, it's not really gonna provide that much of a different view, but it is going to meet the CMP standards um, at this time. And then uh, another, we had talked about the buffer along the south, um, but along with that discussion, uh, we actually decided uh, related to that is to add some buffering along the northern side, uh, which is our loading dock area. Um, so in that section, uh, we've added 15 um, hydrangea um, paniculatas. They're like eight to 10 feet tall. Um, white blooming. So the choice on that was they're deciduous. So they do only mostly provide, you know, summer buffering. Um, but at the same time, because it's a narrow piece of uh, property, um, they can take damage, they can take pruning, and they will come back annually um, and help provide buffer in the, in the following year. I was a little worried about trying to put something evergreen in there. Uh, most of those, once you lose branches or they get damaged, it's hard to recover. Um, so I think it's a um, it's a good solution for that point. Uh, staff comments. Um, there was one uh, about a bike detail, which is, uh, is actually provided. I have a bike detail on the detail sheet, um, bike rack detail, so uh, that was actually there. The buffer along the south, um, where we're trying to, we talked about getting additional plantings in that zone right there. Um, in the narrative, I suggested uh, because uh, the site is, and the surrounding sites are all planted with meadow mix, um, and, and it hasn't really visually been de depicted in anything, and I'll show you a picture in a little bit just of the meadow mix. Um, and it's a taller, it should get to about three feet height um, overall. And that site right there goes slightly uphill uh, to a chain link fence in their yard. So between the, the meadow mix and um, slightly going uphill. I think the idea there for me is, is to try to blur the lines of the lot lines within the innovation district. You know, so if you use a contiguous ground cover in all the lots, you know, I think it makes a nice transition between the lots without having to, you know, try to put some additional, um, some plants in there that don't necessarily, I don't think will do a great deal of, um, mitigating the visual. I think the upper um, northern boundary where we've put some additional buffering is um, the more prudent place for from additional planting. Uh, and then there was one other request for um, planting around the transformer. Um, and again, that, that I'm gonna go back to that buffer planting, um, or not the buffer, the meadow planting is, is kind of providing that. You know, there's a decent distance from immersion drive and um, and I think with that, it's gonna uh, provide the buffering that we need. Again, it's gonna be seasonal, um, but I think it will do the decent job. I'm gonna kinda take you to a couple pictures here, so. Um, so there's the detail sheet. Up in the middle top is the bike rack detail. Um, this is I had for context in case any questions came up for lighting, but I think we've covered that one. So this plan that uh, Nancy had uh, shown, oops, sorry. 
Um, so what the green represents, so what I did, I did have access to um, the planting plans from the adjacent lots. Uh, so the green that you're seeing is the same meadow mix that's being used on all of the lots. Um, so that's a contiguous showy wildflower mix that, you know, is in keeping with the, the uh, you know, the aesthetic of the downs um, and tries to kind of blur the lines between uh, the different lots. And with that, so here is a close-up of a, uh, so I asked the seed provider um, to provide me some images. He doesn't have any long-term images, but these images were from um, one year of growth. So this was uh, an up-close of it. And, and there you can see you know, where you get about three feet height where it's mown down. Um, and then you can see the transition. So uh, in all of those green areas within that innovation district, this should be the ground cover that, that comes through. Um, so that's where I'm thinking, you know, with the transformer and between those two lots, you know, this is going to provide kind of enough visual interest without having to put something separate and, and uh, distinct between those two areas. Um, but obviously that's up, up for discussion, uh, but that's the approach. I just wanted to show that I had thought it out, you know, an overall context versus just, you know, trying to avoid it. I think it would provide a better look. Uh, and I think that's it for my, oh yeah, so here's um, an example of the hydrangea that I'm providing on the, on that northern boundary between the uh, score builders and the loading dock area. Uh, so that's what I have for tonight. I appreciate your time. Madam Chair, I just had a couple of other comments and I won't switch from the screen for right now, but um, <clears throat> to um, Angela's comment about the scorecard, we're certainly um, happy to continue to coordinate with them and provide uh, whatever information is appropriate for this site in the context of what's necessary for the scorecard and work with uh, Drew as well to make sure that all the data is provided as, as necessary and is, is uh, logged in appropriately for that. Um, <clears throat> it's not going to change the um, design of the site, if you will. Uh, we are below the 80% threshold, so it's just a matter of making sure that the documentation is in the correct format and order, and I think Angela would agree with that uh, on that. <clears throat> With regard to uh, coordinating with uh, grading designs on the perimeter properties, if you will, uh, as we noted, um, we did, as part of our site design, look at the grading plans uh, that we had access to for both Dukas. We did the design for uh, Zoom Drain. Uh, we did the uh, grading design for uh, score builders as well. So we looked very closely at that, at those interface points to make sure that we were tying in and making sure that we had uh, good positive drainage uh, in those locations to the intended points of access into the drainage system that were part of the master plan for the innovation district. But we're certainly happy to coordinate further uh, with Angela if there are any questions or concerns that uh, <clears throat> anybody has on those uh, particular items. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out uh, was in response um, to comments that we received at the last meeting, we have added um, two dual electronic vehicle charging stations. They are on the south side of the building. Let's see if I can <clears throat> get back to my plan here. So they're located, there's one here, and it spans these two parking spaces, and there's one here that spans those two parking spaces. So the dual chargers would provide opportunities for four vehicles uh, in that location to have a charging station uh, for that. Uh, <clears throat> and as you know from our last discussion, we are requesting a few waivers on the site. I'd be happy to discuss them individually if you like, but um, I think the, the key one that really had <clears throat> come to play in our last conversation was the, the two points of access on Center Street. And we're confident that we've demonstrated to you that with the alternative of trying to consolidate those 
locations into one, we may be able to avoid the need for that particular waiver, but we still need to have a waiver because there's no physical mathematical location that you can place even one without having to have a waiver from the other driveway locations uh, that are shown on the perimeter on the adjacent sites. And <clears throat> in addition, looking at how a truck would have to maneuver in and out for an emergency situation, we're confident that uh, this plan does represent a good uh, approach to separating the traffic alleviating the congestion and really approaching it from a, a different safety perspective. We have from the peer review comments from Bill Bray, Mr. Bray has supported this design. Uh, he feels that uh, in his memo he indicated that he would support uh, going forward with the two, uh, the two uh, points of access for that. So with that, we certainly uh, welcome any questions that you may have and hopefully this has addressed uh, your comments and concerns. Thank you. Um, this is subject to a public hearing. Uh, I would note that the board has received one uh, email from Anna Butter, and I believe Nancy Vori also received that, received as, well. that as well. Uh, if you care to make a comment, would you please come up to the podium, uh, state your name and address. Uh, do we, if you are online and you would like to make a comment, please use the raise your hand function and we will admit you. Uh, Angela, do we have anybody? Okay, thank you. And nobody is packing up their stuff and running up right now. So the time for public comment is now closed. Um, I'm going to uh, start this off, um, first of all, by, by referencing the public comment that did come in. It came in from an abutter. And I had to kind of scratch my head and think that I have not ever received uh, a comment from an abutter uh, in the innovation district. So this is kind of the first. Uh, and the abutter raised some questions that I'm going to uh, reference. Um, the, the other thing that uh, I want to express my appreciation for the extra work that, that you did to show the uh, show the alternatives uh, of a truck uh, going into or trying to come up with one entrance only on Center Street. And I agree that that's not the solution. Um, that gets us then back to uh, what is the solution or is there an easy solution? And I don't know how many of you play out there play Sudoku. Um, but sometimes when you're playing Sudoku, you have, you put in a, you put in a number and it works and you put in another number and everything's going just fine. And then all of a sudden you realize that way back at the beginning, you made a mistake and you cannot complete the puzzle. And I think we are in that sort of situation now. Um, as I referenced last time, I, this is an, in effect an infill lot. There are lots on either side of it that already have their driveways. Uh, they already have their buildings up, um, and this building and this uh, lot, uh, this building is trying to fit itself onto a lot and is having a great deal of difficulty doing that. Going back to the first time uh, we discussed this and the first time we started to take a look at the issues, one thing that we did not really bring up is the size of the building. And it appears to me as though uh, there is no happy solution. The building is too large for the lot. I took a look at some alternatives and each alternative led me in effect to a, a blank wall, some place where I had to stop because it wasn't an answer. Uh, for instance, the buildings in the center, in the front lots in the Innovation District are supposed to have a close relationship with the street. It was not, it was difficult to have that sort of close relationship to the street for this building because if it were moved forward, there would be no way that there could be access onto the Zoom drain lot given the bump out of that building. So that we would end up with a dead end parking lot 
uh, and not enough not enough space to put um, parking parking spaces on the side of the building. I took a look at the waiver requests and considering that one of the requests was really accommodated two different things, uh, there were five waiver requests. We've never had five waiver requests come before us. That starts to tell me that there's a problem fitting the building on the lot. There was one waiver that required, that was for two uh, entrances on Center Street. The building actually has, in effect, four areas of access, two on Center Street, one on Immersion, and one through Zoom Drain. There was a waiver for the distance of those two access uh, locations on Center Street, which actually should have been two separate waivers because the board might have wanted to address one and not the other, or to approve one and not the other. There was another waiver requesting a waiver for the 10 foot, foot uh, distance from the abutter. That was brought up uh, by Mr. Giles and one waiver for the 24-foot parking aisle. That's an attempt, as my grandmother frequently said when I was doing something wrong, you're trying to put 10 pounds of potatoes in an eight pound sack. I, and you are trying to put a building that in effect is too large onto that site. Without the ability to go over onto Zoom drain, um, you would not be able to at all fit that building with any of the parking spaces or with enough parking spaces. Last time I suggested that the employees go in through immersion drive. Uh, that was, idea was discarded. I will point out that it is quite possible to set, to close off the southerly center street access that you propose, put a mountable sidewalk on there such a, a mountable curb, such that the, a fire truck could access the southerly side of the building without doing an actual curb cut. That's something I think should be explored. I think the building is tight enough that taking a look at a 10 foot space between the, zoo, between the uh, score builder's driveway and the driveway, the northerly driveway, I think less than 10 feet is unreasonable. And it's the 10 feet that's called for in the standards. I do commend you for the way you have developed the uh, transportation, the transit of the trucks that cuts down a lot of impervious surface. It is possible to still have those, I would hope, um, but I do think you need to take a hard look at that, that 10 foot. I'm troubled, very troubled by the lot and the building and the attempt to push that building onto the lot. Uh, I think there are still opportunities for this lot, there are opportunities taking a look at the size of the building or the format of the building. Um, I think using Zoom Drain uh, is a great way of taking a look at the potential for, for cutting down on extra uh, impervious service. It's a type of shared parking. I think you had some very good ideas for trying to make this building fit. The one thing I just never heard is a smaller building, which would then mean less parking available. I do want to say, um, in terms of what I, uh, what else I heard, um, I still don't see adequate snow removal. Uh, I appreciate the added 12 by 12 foot space with the granite benches. Uh, I think the transformer needs more than seasonal, uh, seasonal buffering and seasonal uh, landscaping. 
Um, I think it's quite possible for you to add a panel on the right-hand wall. It's going to take a long time for that tree to grow. So it doesn't have to be windows, but it can be a detail that people do see. I, I, think, uh, I also think that the flower mixture, as uh, the landscape architect talked about, uh, is reasonable in terms of blurring uh, the division between buildings and creating some uniformity. So there's a lot that's, that's very positive, uh, but I, I have some real concerns. Uh, and I think uh, Mr. Giles's comments really brought them to the surface. So saying that, I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, members of the planning board. Uh, Roger, would you like to go next? Madam Chair, if I could just interject at this point, I wanted to bring on a couple of notes um, with regard to the comments that you, you had made with regard to the intensity of the development on the site. This is two lots in the Innovation District. In the original planning, and Dan and Rocky are here as, as well as Drew, in the original planning, it's my understanding that each of these lots had contemplated an approximately 15,000 square foot building on it. So 15 times two is 30 and we're below that. In addition, there's an 80% lot coverage standard that was set for the Innovation District. We are below that. So while I certainly respect your opinion and your comments on that, I want the board to understand that we are proceeding within the confines of the original framework that was established for the Innovation District. We're not above that threshold on impervious cover that we need to be seeking any additional capacity out of the, the storm uh, drain system. We are within the confines of what was the original estimate for building size on these two lots combined. To comment about the 10 foot uh, separation distance, particularly in the uh, area of score builders, I wanted to highlight to you, see if I can do the screen share here. <clears throat> Can you see, did you take me off? No. Let's do the screen share again then. There we go. So this dashed line that you see right along here, that's a 10 foot setback. So we do have 10 feet along this area here. We do have a section that is less than 10 feet, and that is up around the appendage for the docks. And that is the area, as Keith had pointed out, he has provided additional understory plantings with the hydrangea in addition to the canopy tree plantings that are all along this side. So that is a location where we are asking for a waiver to less than the 10 foot separation, but we have a long stretch along here that meets that standard. That's the property line, the back corner of the score builder's lot. So while we respect the comments that came in from our abutter, and we certainly don't want to have um, unhappy neighbors, if you will, we are trying to do what we can uh, to address that. I looked very closely at the grading in this location here to make sure that we were at the same elevation as the grade in score builders. Uh, so that particular area there where we are a little bit closer, we're not dealing with a dramatic change in grade across the site. So I did want to point out those two or three items um, in response to your comments. We certainly respect your comments and um, just wanted to get that out for everybody. All right, so you, you do have 10 feet. We have uh, 10 feet in a portion of it. We are asking for a waiver in this location here where it's less than 10 feet and we have less than 10 feet mm -hmm. along the Ducas construction side. Mm -hmm. So that dash line represents 10 feet. All right, thank you. Roger. Sam? One prospective tenant right now. Okay. Um, is there any likelihood that these these access points could be changed depending on the future tenants? No. Okay. Well, <clears throat> um, 
I understand the chair's um, concern, and and you know the the, the thing that struck me listening to uh, your presentation, Nancy, was um, Center Street is going to be one of the main roads going through this whole project. Um, so I think you know site site uh, distance and everything is going to be critically important. Um, I I. I understand uh, the chair's concerns, but I, I, I would tend to um, support our uh, consultant, Bill Bray's comments on this regarding the um, access points. I think it's kind of a unique situation here with the, um, you know, the two lots between Center Street and, and Immersion Drive. Um, so I, I think you've explained everything, you know, to my satisfaction. I do have a question on the, um, this is not related to this, this is related to something else, and I know we have a board member who's an expert on this, but I, I'm just kind of curious on the, um, the charging stations for the vehicles. I, I don't know anything about those things, okay? So how do you determine, uh, for instance, if they, if they have a, um, um, like an Elon Musk type vehicle, what, what are they called? What are you talking about? Charging stations. <laughs> You're talking about EVs? Yeah. You've got your, your plug-in EVs? Yeah, are they, are they universal? Well, except for Tesla. Well, that's what I mean. Okay. So how do you, how do you know which one to put in? Uh, we were anticipating more of the universal kind. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. I hadn't anticipated Tesla. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I don't have anything else at this point. I'm, I'm just going to wait and see what, what, what emerges. Thank you, Roger. Jen? Um, just a couple of clarifying questions. I saw where you had quantified the number of parking spaces that you're providing, but um, unless I overlooked it, I didn't see the number of parking spaces required for the building, and so I was curious if the development program has shown works. Um, basically, are you providing any excess parking spaces? And if so, or if not, um, do you meet the requirements for parking without uh, access? Like if the easement to the zoom drain lot and the parking spaces um, that straddle that area were not provided do you still meet parking requirements with what is fully on your site? Do you understand? So to answer your question, we are uh, providing parking at a ratio of two spaces per thousand square feet, which is in accordance with the industry and manufacturing, I believe it is, a ratio in the, or in the ordinance. So we are providing 56 parking spaces, which is based on that, and those 56 include those spaces that are partially on the Zoom drain lot. So you need all 56 to meet that requirement, that's what you're saying? We need all 56 to meet the ordinance standard for that. However, if there happens to be a use that comes in that doesn't need that, there may be an opportunity to ask the board that it not be built, but we don't know that at this point. So we've done just based on the uniform, two spaces per thousand square feet. Sure, thank you. Um, I was curious about, you know, just longer term way down the road if either one of these um, properties were to change hands or someone were to make changes to it and that easement were to then come into question, does it work with what um, you're providing? So thank you for that answer. The, the yeah. easement is in perpetuity. Okay. Um, and then I was also wondering if you could provide, and if we went over this the last time, I apologize, but perhaps just a really brief recap if you could, on um, whether or not you have a sense for how many trucks, what volume of truck activity per day may be coming and going from the site um, at either one of the northerly driveways, so the ones that you're intending just for truck traffic. Uh, we don't have a tenant defined at this point, so I can't give you any solid numbers. I believe that Goral Palmer did the trip generation rate based on an ITE uh, typical use. That's all that we have on that. Okay. Um, 
questions answered. And um, I also uh, appreciate certainly the additional graphic showing um, the one consolidated driveway. I know sometimes that does just feel like extra work if perhaps um, you know, the site may not head in that direction, but it's definitely, it was helpful for me too to see some of those, um, the turning movements in conjunction with that consolidated driveway. So thank you for that effort there. In, in addition to the um, photos of plants, I always think that's helpful. So thanks <laughs> uh, for that. So the, um, I like the, the aesthetic of the meadow mix that's proposed here and elsewhere in the um, innovation district. And um, I, I do also agree with Rachel that I do think some sort of additional fenestration in that question, uh, the corner in question would be, would just really um, enhance the building from, from all possible sides, um, particularly because, you know, I, I, I like the idea of sort of the focal tree there, but um, having just planted some brand new trees at my own house. I, they're just like, they can't grow fast enough. Um, and I just think it would help uh, with continuity of what the other sort of aesthetic that you're providing around the, other, the rest of the building. Um, aside from that, on the topic of the waivers, um, I, I generally don't have an issue with what's being proposed here. Um, I understand that two driveways is not perhaps what our ordinance is looking at here, but um, I think that there's some merit to separating large vehicle traffic from um, smaller smaller vehicle traffic coming in and out of the site. Um, from a general day-to-day -day standpoint, as well as um, the you know emergency access and longer term things like that, um, I appreciated the comment about, I did originally have a question about where the um, 10 feet and five feet were being measured from and I, uh, my assumption was wrong. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Jen. Rick? Yeah, um, first, thank you for the addition of the chargers. I know it's, I get on that soapbox all the time, but I appreciate that. And the fact that this may be uh, benefiting uh, from potential uh, solar panels. I saw that in the narrative as well and encouraged that you're looking at the, uh, the snow load, and the, the roof load, and um, can, can apply those panels. Um, it could certainly help you save money in the long run. Don't put in a natural gas line. You'll be all set. We don't need to go combustion in that, in that building at all if possible. Uh, given that, uh, thanks for doing that. I am a little concerned about five waivers, as Rachel pointed out. Are we trying to put a square peg in a round hole? Um, and uh, I'm hearing from my colleagues uh, that generally they're comfortable. I too like the fact that we're not, uh, we're keeping truck traffic away from uh, the, the pedestrian vehicles. So that, that to me is a, is a big plus. Um, you seem to have an answer for, for the questions uh, that sound reasonable to me. And um, uh, therefore I don't have any, anything else except do look at what buffering might be able to be done around the transformer keeping in with CMP because looking at that rendering with one tree, you, uh, I, I still think that that could be an eyesore and um, take a look at maybe putting in some sort of um, panel or something in that corner there where that one tree is going for continuity of fetestration appearance. Um, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. I've got uh, one final comment. Um, you referenced what would happen if there were two lots. Uh, and I would suggest that what would happen is the second lot when it came to us would be even more constrained than uh, this current lot. Um, with two lots, I, there would probably be less question and less need because there would be probably not the four-foot doors, 
um, for the two, the two entrances, but we don't know. We take each application as it comes. We could speculate what would happen had this come to us as a, uh, a single lot, um, the original half of what we've got now, and then a year later, the second lot, uh, and I suspect we would be having some of the same conversations because as the last lots built, there are constraints that have been created by the earlier lots that set up their, um, set up their access. Uh, so we don't know. Uh, we can simply speculate on that. Uh, I do request that you uh, work with the, um, talk with the fire department and see if it is possible that there be a mountable, uh, a mountable curb where you have the southerly curb cut right now that would move all of the, uh, all of the employees except for the ones that you have on the uh, four or five parking spaces in the northerly lot. Um, that would move all of them to come in on uh, Immersion Drive and to exit on Immersion Drive. Alternatively, um, take a look at having a, that as a one-way. You have four access cuts to this site. One through Zoom Drain, one through Immersion, and two through Center is what you're proposing. Um, so I think you still have some alternatives. I think you still have a way to fit this building uh, on, on the lot, but I think, um, I think we need to see it again. Do you have any questions? Um, I guess I would give the applicant a chance. Would you like to say anything, Sam? We did our best to try to make this a, a feasible building. Um, there's money that needs to be invested, and you try to get a return on your uh, Excuse me, could you speak into the you microphone? You try please? to get a return on your investment when you do that. Mm -hmm. And it's very frustrating to come to you guys, try to stay in the boundaries, and have one person kind of dictate where this goes. That, that is frustrating to me. I'm not, I don't do a lot of this. I'm new to this, and I just don't understand it. So I, I need a little explanation on why that happens. I had one, two, three that approved, and it seems like you're controlling this. And can you help me understand that a little better? Probably not. As, as the chair, I try to lead the board. Mm -hmm. I try to point out to the developers ways that they can meet the requirements of the design standards and the ordinances. As I said at the beginning, you're asking in effect for five waivers. That's not something that we've seen before. I understand the concern and the need to make money, uh, that you have an investment to make and you need an appropriate return on that investment. Um, I think uh, there is still a way to have that size building on the lot, but I think it's something that needs to be explored. I think we've exhausted all those options. I've offered you another option. That's up to you if you decide to take it. Could we do a I've, off I've offered you two options uh, that asked you to take a look at them. And we're going to have the same result next time? Don't know. Can I, you know, I, 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 I want to see. I want to ask for a straw poll? I have asked. No, you may not. Why not? Because I say no. I could jump in. I mean, any. Please. <laughs> any board member could make a motion at, at any point if they chose to. Correct. Um, there are four members with equal power. Um, so if another board member is interested in pursuing this design, then that's, that's, that's a possibility. Thanks. Well, if nobody else wants to say anything, I, I think it would be worthwhile at least getting the consent or, or the sense of the board whether to, um, to you know, continue on what, you know, the, um, the question, you know, what you're looking for, Rachel, or whether whether the rest of us are 
satisfied with the um, with the presentation as as made. Is that a motion? Is that a motion? I guess I can make it as a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. All in favor? Call the roll. I have a staff has drafted a motion um, for the project. Is that what you're looking for, Roger? Or are you, what are you no, making I a motion for? No, I believe for the for? consent for the to well, determine it. Well, there seems to be some question about whether the the whole board is in agreement with the chair on this. Uh, you know, c to continue looking at other other avenues, okay. other access points, and things yep. like that. So um, maybe we could get us just a sense of the feel of the rest of the board. All right. Can can I just clarify? So mm -hmm. are you just saying the curb cuts? Because there are other waivers and other issues. I guess I would want some clarification of staff well, on the buffer, the ten foot, because we didn't really talk about the south and the grading differences. So I guess I'd like to you to clarify, you're just talking about curb cuts and the circulation, or are you talking about all five waivers? I think, well, my, my I think my, uh, <laughs> primarily the, the concern that you have is, a, is the curb cuts. I, I have, I have uh, a concern I you, about, I know you yeah, all a whole of them. bunch of yeah. things, but I, that's your primary, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you raised last time, and that's what you're, you're still concerned about, so. I mean, I think I think that they have responded to the buffering and some of the other things. We have a motion. Does, does somebody know what it is? I guess so. No, we don't. Uh, well, Roger, what is your motion? Okay, I would say the motion is to um, accept the um, the the access points as they are presented to us in the current form. So is it possible to, or I'm sorry, just to, <laughs> to interject here, but is it helpful to go through the waiver? Like that's one waiver, is, is that, and then to move forward with each, is that what you're suggesting, Roger? Well, I, I just, it's- Because it doesn't sound like you're voting on the whole project, but specific waiver request. Am well, I correct? I think the chair is, primary concern, as was expressed at the last meeting, <coughs> was the number of access points, curb cuts. Which is one of the waivers. That's one of right, the waivers. One of the waivers. And I think if we can get this, because this is what, as I understand this is what you, this is primarily what you want them to go back and take a look at and see if they can come up with another alternative plan. In other words, eliminating one of the access points on Santa Street. I, since there are so many waivers, I'm not willing to say that yet, Roger. Okay. Well, why, why, why don't we just um, have, a, have a, a vote on the access points? I think that will eliminate a major, major thing. I don't know if the others agree with me on this. Well, we have, uh, once again, I'm not clear we have a motion. I know you're, you're trying to make one. I'm not clear what it is. Well, I... As I said, I think, I mean, you raised this at the last meeting and, and you, you brought up again that my impression is you're not satisfied with their explanation for the access points. And that seems to be the primary concern you have. Granted, there's a list of other, other uh, waiver requests, but that seems to be the primary one. And- Roger, I'm uncomfortable that you're um, making somehow or other my concern the focal point of this motion. Oh, okay. Um, there is, Roger, if you look at the weight, well, I can pass this around. So staff, draft, staff drafted this earlier today, um, and waiver number three is permit the two full access driveways. So perhaps you could focus your thoughts on that, if that's where you're, where you're headed. I, I would point out that there are actually three well, all right, two full access, no, three full access. Along Center Street. So permit the two full access driveways on along Center Street. Center Street. On Center Street, that's what that would be, right? Then I guess along Center Street and Immersion Drive, since they both are full access. And through Zoom Drain. Wouldn't there be three full access? 
two on center and one on immersion, and uh, then one they, on Zoom? Well, anyway, so that's a total of four. Yeah, three, three on, the, on the site and then one on... Well, they Zoom. exit the site into Zoom yes, yeah, and then yeah. exit from yeah, there. Yeah. So it's an indirect access. So instead of per, uh, permit for two full access driveways, it should be three? Yes. Or it should be four? Three? Uh, no, I think uh, the question becomes the definition of full access. Uh, and, and I'm not comfortable redrafting motions on the fly, but. Mm. Well, let me ask you this. Um, on immersion, is that, are those two, is that a full access off of immersion going into the site? In the northeast corner is a full um, two-way access up by the, the loading docks. The access that ties into Zoom Drain, uh, we're tying into Zoom Drain's full access onto the end of immersion. So okay. that depends on where you draw the line. <laughs> okay. It's so a shared access on one, and it's a full access onto immersion okay. on the other. Okay, so we're talking three full access onto this particular site, and then one on you know, utilizing Zoom. One shared. Yeah, one shared. Yeah. So a total of four accesses. Instead of two. I'm a little, if I may, I'm a little uncomfortable saying it's four because one is because of mutual uh, conveyance from one lot to another. So I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable calling that a full access. Uh, but certainly there's three full access um, on this site, those two lots. Two off of center and one off of immersion. Madam Chair, could I ask for clarification on that ordinance provision, whether it is two points of access on one street or two points of access on one lot? The ordinance reads one, two points of access, more than one point of access on one lot. On one lot? Correct. Very well, thank you. So in, in that, it's really, you're putting two access points on one of the lots and one access point on another lot that's coming off of Immersion Drive. Uh, no, they, there was only one lot when we approved the subdivision. Uh, understood. I'm just trying to, mm -hmm. to, to try and, and make some sense of an infill kind of a situation, and that's what we have here. Uh, and, it, and it is the challenge. Um, okay, I'll just leave it at that. Roger, do you have a motion? <clears throat> well, do we want to make the motion based on Center Street then? And um, I'd make a motion that we accept both access points on Center Street, basically leaving the other two access points, the one on Immersion and the one, um, you know, integrating on Zoom. Leave that alone. The only waiver that has come through has been for Center Street. Okay. The only waiver request. Okay. And that's the two full access driveways on Center Street. Correct. However, consider the waiver that must also go along with that, and that is the distance. There are two, uh, the two site accesses on Center Street do not have the required distance between the abutting uh, access ways. So the access um, for lot, I think, 51, um, I believe, is 40 feet away. And for score builders, it's 10 feet instead of the required 90 feet. And, yeah, OK. I, I, and, and again, I'm very uncomfortable trying to draft a motion on the fly. Um, because, well, like, like Sudoku, you add one thing and then you've got to add something else. You've got to have something else. I, I guess my, I guess the point I, I initially was trying to make is that um, y you have very strong opinions about how this should be set up, and I was suggesting we get a sense of the board as to whether we should basically follow your lead on that or whether the rest of us are comfortable with it as it's pre uh, presented. Then make that as a motion in terms of that you vote uh, on a waiver. 
Uh, Rick, do you have something? Yeah, I just don't think we should be making motions on certain aspects like that because there's uh, maybe a disagreement between one person and others. I, I just think that starts to set a bad precedent to to be doing that. Either we have a motion for the applicant based on the the package that we've reviewed and we've deliberated over, or we don't. Uh, but to, to have a motion to try and parse things out because of, you know, having different opinions just doesn't feel right to me. Yeah, I mean, may I suggest you just do a straw poll of the board That's, whether you're comfortable on the motions and are the waivers. I mean, the fact is that there, there are four to five waivers um, for the project, so they're, they're not meeting those standards in the ordinance. So... I like that idea better than to a formal motion. All right, do I hear, do you make a motion? No. Uh, uh, Rick, uh, well, uh, Roger, you sort of made a motion. Jen? <laughs> I just have a quick question, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you could clarify again for me, because you've mentioned a couple of times, um, a, a one of the waivers that you are sort of interpreting as a two-part waiver. Could you just reiterate that again to me? Uh, the, the waiver that, as I understand it, they requested is that we waive the distance between the other curb cuts, the other access points. And since there are two separate access points, there are actually two separate waivers that would need to be made. Now, the one for each, driveway. One for each. the developer Understood. combined it, but it's really somebody could vote for one and not the other. I see. Thank you. That's helpful. Madam Chair, if I could just add something on that. As we explained in our application materials and tonight's discussion, mathematically, there is no way to avoid the need, even with one curb cut on Center Street, to have the need for that waiver. There's no way to have the need for the waiver or to avoid the need? There's no way to avoid the need for a waiver even if we have only one curb cut. We still have to have that waiver. Cor correct, but you could have one, you could have agreement on one driveway and not the other. That's why I say in effect there are two waivers because you have two driveways, you're proposing two access driveways that do not have the 90, required 90 feet. What I'm saying is even if we went to the mathematical midpoint between the two, we still cannot meet those separation distances on either side. Unless you didn't provide, propose any. Unless there were no access points on Center Street. Correct. Correct. But you still have, the question becomes, are two curb cuts allowable? And if they are, can there be a waiver on each one? Because if one curb cut, the decision is no, then there's no need for a waiver if there's no curb cut. When you re put in the request for a waiver, you conflated the two of them, but it's possible that somebody would vote for one and not the other. The need doesn't go away, but the decision would be... The decision process, yes. Uh, Madam Chair, can, okay. I, can I suggest we just um, make a motion to, ex you know, read the draft motion, all right? Get a second, then have a discussion on that, and then vote on that. That's the, you mean for the whole project? Yes. Let me ask the board if you're ready to vote on the whole project. I would be, yes. Okay. Rick, are you ready to vote on the whole project? Yes. All right. Yes. Roger, are you yes. ready to vote on the whole project? Yes. All right. In that case, we will read the draft motion. I move to approve the site plan project list titled Lot 48 and 49, uh, Innovation District, as depicted on the plan set prepared by St. Clair Associates, dated 7221, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. 
Findings, the applicant is proposing to construct a 27,940 square foot building that will consist of two to three tenant spaces for light industrial use. The proposal also includes truck loading areas, two site driveways, parking, landscaping provisions, and pedestrian amenities. The project is located on lot 48 of the Innovation District, Innovation District subdivision and it was within the Crossroads Planned Development CPD Zoning District. The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review, zoning ordinance, and the Innovation District regulating plan requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers, one, permit the proposed driveway separation as depicted on the plan set. Two, permit the location of the northerly driveway within 10 feet of the side property line. Three, permit the three full access drive, two full access driveways along Center Street. Four, permit the proposed parking aisle width of 24 feet. Conditions prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, additional windows along the primary building elevation as noted in the staff review memo, dated 7 1421, excuse me, 7 1921. B, update the building elevations plan sheet to depict the eastern elevation as the secondary elevation. C, buffering provisions between the southern parking area and the abutting property to the south. D, depict the formal access easement associated with lot 54 on the site plan. E, a detail of the proposed bike racks. F, additional plantings to the site east and south of the transformer on the site. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicants shall A, pay the traffic impact fees, B, provide approval from the Portland Water District, C, provide approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District, D, address the remaining review comments in the civil peer review memo from Woodward and Curran dated 7-14-21. E, address the remaining review comments of the traffic peer review memo from Traffic Solutions dated 7-8-21. F, coordinate with staff on the overall Innovation District Subdivision Stormwater Tracking Scorecard to clarify this tracking mechanism. G, identify the proposed materials, colors, and features on the building elevations. G, provide confirmation that the proposed light fixtures are full cutoff fixtures as required by the site plan review ordinance. I, uh, coordinate with the police department in regards to addressing the proposed building. J, execute and record the formal access agreement associated with lot 54. K, provide spot grades and necessary storm drain infrastructure design to ensure no standing water along abutting property lines. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall provide a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Four, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and the site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Five, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, a copy of the modified main dot traffic movement permit shall be submitted to the planning department. Is there a second? Second. Roger Bealey seconded. Comments from the board? Um, I have a question. Does, does item K about uh, spot grades and necessary storm drain infrastructure address your concerns, Angela, about tying into adjacent property lines? That was um, my attempt to provide something, okay. I think, last minute. Just, um, just, I guess, for the benefit of the board, um, the Dukas property drops uh, probably about two feet off right to the property line. So for them to grade, they're going back up, just so you know. And so you have a very limited space 
that you're showing on your plan right now, um, and without a grading easement across it, that's where I think you're going to end up with the low spot there. And so I was thinking if you need to add some sort of under drain or something like that to tie into your catch basin, it's definitely a hole that's being formed there. So that was the concern. So I'm trying um, in the very limited space, though, because there is not a whole lot of room between that property line and the paved surface. So I'm hoping that Nancy can come up with some magic. That's why we put a catch basin <laughs> in that vicinity, so we can take care of that. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Can I just ask for clarification? Any other questions? Uh, no. Any other questions from the board? Any other amendments? I have one additional amendment uh, and that we did not have a chance to speak to, and that was add additional snow storage. So that would be L. Maybe put that under the no. first condition since it's a plan edit. OK. That's what I would do. All right, does the board have any other questions? And the other comments? All right, um, Doreen, please call the roll. Rachel Hendrickson? No. Roger Bealy? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Rick Meinking? Yes. All right, the plan. The plan has passed. Thank you. Thank you. And we now, uh, Nancy, I guess you get to stand there. We now go to item number six. GNC LLC requests a site plan amendment review for 336 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 1. Jamel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so this proposal is located in the General Business District, uh, B3, at the existing Crossroads Autocraft along Route 1. So the applicant's proposing to convert the existing residence use on the property to an, an office use. The proposal also includes five additional parking spaces and landscaping provisions along the Route 1 frontage. So as the board may recall, the project was subject or was granted approval for a miscellaneous appeal um, for the conversion of an expansion of illegal non-conforming use of which you provided an advisory opinion for several months back uh, by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So staff's only uh, comment related to site design um, from planning is re just related to the site plan review requirement for projects to provide for street trees um, along transportation corridors. So that staff's recommended a row of uh, street trees along their frontage. And I believe Angela um, has some comments related to the proposed rain garden. Um, you will see in Woodard and Kern's comments that there is an increase in, in runoff to Route 1 based on this. Uh, however, they did not um, model the rain garden that's proposed. And looking at the soils, though, it's, it's not evident what that infiltration rate may be or if at all. Um, it's pretty poor soils. So I guess what I was hoping to get is... Um, some information um, in that area of the soils to see if it will actually infiltrate stormwater. And if I think if there is some um, evidence showing that, then you're going to decrease the flow coming off the site. It was obviously they were not showing any, and so it was showing that increase. I think it would be important to demonstrate that something can infiltrate into the, those soils that are on the site. So I guess that's what I would be looking for is additional information um, to show that, that that's possible to in order to get the peak flow rates um, back to the existing conditions. Thank you. Jamel, any more? Anything else? Uh, staff did provide the board with a draft motion uh, for your consideration. That's it. Thank you. Uh, for the applicant, Nancy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let's see, can I screen share now? There we go. Uh, so as uh, Jamel had noted, uh, this is an application that is before you folks. You actually saw it several weeks ago uh, when we were asking for a board um, advisory opinion to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a uh, miscellaneous appeal in order to allow the expansion of the grandfathered non-conforming existing garage and shop. This is Crossroads Auto Craft. It's located on Route 1 uh, opposite the entrance to Scarborough Downs. 
So on this site right now, the building that is at the front of the site closest to Route 1, right here, is a residence. And it's been occupied as a residence for decades. Uh, and the shop out behind here has been occupied uh, by Crossroads Autocraft. And what the applicant is proposing to do uh, is to actually convert the residence from a residential use to an office use uh, associated with Crossroads Auto Craft. And if you recall from the prior plan, uh, back a few weeks ago, the applicant had also proposed an expansion of the garage and shop. They've actually uh, taken that out of their program. So it's simply a matter of converting the existing residence into a um, office for Crossroads Auto Craft. There is a new fence that's proposed along this edge here in order to enclose the area uh, for the dumpster. They have uh, like caps from Jeeps that, they're being, that are being worked on that they temporarily store in that area too. So it provides a nice uh, area for screening uh, behind there. But it takes away some of the parking that was proposed for the site and existed on the site um, prior to this proposed uh, conversion to the office space. In addition, behind the residence in this location here, there had been a fenced in area that was used for the house. That was their sort of backyard area, if you will. And there was parking associated with the house. With the house use going away, we've converted that area to parking uh, for the business. And we have an access aisle striped here to provide access to the rear door uh, to the building for the office use. And a net change in that is a displacement of some of the parking here. Uh, and so what we've proposed is to remove or relocate five spaces here that would be for display. Um, this site has a capped number of uh, display spaces on it. We've simply relocated them. Uh, and the net change is one additional parking space for the business. So it does include an expansion of impervious cover, that, right in that little light shaded area there. That's the area. And it actually drains out, and there's a catch basin right there in Route 1 that picks up the runoff from this lawn area here. So what we propose to do uh, in order to compensate for that is to put in a small rain garden. In this location here, we have a planting of perennials and ornamental grasses uh, that are located in that uh, garden. That area, the plantings have been selected based on the Cooperative Extension's recommendation for rain garden plantings for native species, species that are hardy to that setting, et cetera. We selected ones that provided a diversity of height, color, um, seasonal variation, that type of thing. So we do have that. Um, when we did the mathematics on uh, the increase in impervious cover, because we have such a small tributary area to that catch basin, it did show a slight increase. We had asked for a waiver uh, on that slight increase because it was uh, quite a small uh, increase, basically um, very, very small in the context of stormwater. Um, but as both Angela and Woodard and Kern had acknowledged, our modeling didn't compensate or accommodate the benefits of the uh, rain garden in allowing uh, stormwater to attenuate and potentially infiltrate. Uh, so I think from uh, Angela's comments, she's looking to have us perhaps provide some soils information specific to that area. Uh, and we'd certainly be happy to work with Angela and staff on providing additional test pit data or auger data uh, for that to demonstrate that. But that is basically the uh, proposal in a nutshell, if you will. We did get approval uh, from the uh, Board of Appeals, and that's why we're back here for you folks. Thank you. Uh, this is subject to a public hearing. Is there anybody from the public who care to make a statement? Uh, do we have anybody online, Angela, who's raised their hand? Not yet. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, throw this open to comments uh, or observations by the board. I'm all set. All right, Roger's all set. I, um, I recall somewhere I read that you were going to paint the house, but I forgot what color, or could you? 
Uh, the color was provided in it. I believe it's a gray. It's a gray. Um, okay. Yeah. I think that's okay. So that's going to get a fresh kind of a facelift as well. Correct. It will match the building, the garage. It's going to be painted the same yep. color. No. Um, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Jen, any comments? Um, no, not other than um, just reiterating um, the what will end, what has ended up in the draft motion, and that um, being that the driveway here that there be future coordination between this driveway and, and any other um, improvements that are made to that intersection and or Route One in that area. I, I do think that's a good. Um, a good benefit for everyone, the, the business and um, the public coming through here as well. That's all. All right. If there are no more comments, we do have a draft motion. I move to approve the site plan project titled 336 U.S. Route 1 is depicted on the plan set prepared by St. Clair Associates dated 6 21 with the following findings and conditions. Findings. The applicant is proposing to convert the existing residence use on the property to an office use, which was approved by the Board of Appeals. The proposal also includes five new parking spaces and landscaping along the property's Route 1 frontage. The pro project is located at 336 U.S. Route 1 and is within the General Business B3 Zoning District. The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Conditions. Number one. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include deciduous street trees as noted in the staff review memo dated 7 21 This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees, B, provide documentation to demonstrate adequate infiltration rate of the existing soils in the general area of the rain garden to maintain existing peak flow rates from the site. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, at the time of Route 1 intersection improvements, the applicant shall either participate in the improvements associated with their leg of the signalized intersection in accordance with main DOT requirements, or the driveway will need to be eliminated. Four, per Board of Appeals condition of approval, no more than 20 vehicles are to be displayed on the property at one time. Five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Is there a second? Second. Second from Rick Meinking. Does the board have any comments or amendments? Hearing none, uh, Doreen, will you call the roll? Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Roger Bealey? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Rick Meinking? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And next on the agenda, item number seven, MoCo Tech LLC requests a preliminary subdivision review for 124 Sawyer Road, Assessor's Map R54, Lot 4. Uh, for the purpose of information of, of the board or guidance for the board, this is in effect a sketch plan review. That's what we're looking at. Uh, Jamel? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the applicant's proposing a three-lot subdivision on a single property that consists of one single-family home at this time. The proposal also includes uh, additional curb cut along Sawyer Road. So during the review, staff was not able to uh, locate or find the required net residential calculation, which in the submission package, um, this calculation is a requirement um, and shall be provided prior to the board granting uh, preliminary approval for the project. Staff also noted that the applicant did not include a formal wetland report 
Um, and the board does require completion of a wetland delineation uh, within five years of a formal application. So this will also have to be provided as well. The applicant's requesting a waiver from the requirement to provide stormwater management for the project. And as noted in the staff review memo, uh, staff has recommended that the applicant uh, include a stormwater management report, uh, given that the proposal does um, include uh, additional impervious cover on the property. And staff also recommended, uh, based on the zoning standards, that some sort of pedestrian gathering area uh, within the village green open space uh, be, be provided at the center of the project to meet the 10% requirement. And uh, finally, uh, given that the applicant's not proposing any new public roads as part of the sub subdivision, staff has recommended uh, that the applicant provide funds equal to the construction of a sidewalk along the property's uh, Sawyer Road frontage to the town's multimodal reserve account. At this point, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, is there somebody here from the applicant? Is somebody online? I just elevated Paul Gadboys, the panelist. Oh, nope. Someone else is raising their hand. <laughs> Cheryl Morgan. Let's try that. Hi there, this is Cheryl Morgan. Can you hear me? I can. I can. Thank you. Um, yeah, just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, Cheryl Morgan, I'm the owner of Moco Tech LLC. I purchased the property um, and with the new zoning laws with uh, sewer availability, I was, and I have Paul Gadboys here as my surveyor, but we were looking at adding two additional lots for single family home development. Um, I also have Matthew Chamberlain here, who is my um, broker for real estate as well. So um, we have reviewed the feedback and I do have a number of pieces of information to return back to you before the next meeting, um, but we can talk through those as needed. You guys will just have to guide me through here. Uh, why don't, why don't you provide us with additional information. You may have to put that in writing in your subsequent oh, submissions, but. Exactly, okay, yeah. sure. Happy to walk through it there. Um, first and foremost, talking about the net residential calculation, we, we had a review on that just a couple of days ago. Happy to provide that along with the, um, along with the formal submission back. Uh, Paul, if you have anything you want to add specifically to this conversation, please feel free. He's still on mute, so I'll move forward. Um, for the uh, wetlands delineation, actually, I did have Basswood Environmental do the uh, environment you know, review. So we just didn't, we just forgot to submit that. So we'll be able to put that into the packet for resubmission for next month as well, um, didn't have any note of vernal pools, just the wetlands as we had delineated and put on the map for you. Um, with the 10% uh, development, I guess my question is just, we, we asked for a waiver because the, the point and the, the goal is to put in two additional lots right along the roadside. There's not a HOA assigned to it. It's just additional lots. And because of the number of them, we couldn't just break off a lot. We had to uh, request the subdivision. So um, is there, I, I don't know if there's a fee or how that would work uh, with the way that the lots are lined. I can jump in now if you want. Can you hear me? Please. Sean? Yeah. I, the zoning ordinance does not allow for a waiver of that standard. Um, so the board has to follow that standard in their review. So you're going to have to work through. I know it's a little different because it's a three lot subdivision. That's not really what the vision of this district was, but it's still a standard. So you're going to have to work through that uh, with the planning board. Okay. I know the cottages right behind uh, this lot, uh, perhaps there's a way we can consolidate the open space to, to make it beneficial for everyone, but we can, we can take that on. Paul, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, 
Um, well, he's on mute again. So uh, again, we're talking about 6,000 square feet, I believe. So that shouldn't be a problem putting it toward, toward the back end of the, the current lot right there. Um, looking at the next section there, we've got the uh, sidewalks and shade trees. So I understand that I, shade trees I guess my question is with the sidewalks. I'm not really sure what that would mean right now. There are no sidewalks on either side. There's no sidewalks with the open space. So I, I need a little bit more information on what that would be if you're looking for funds. I, I don't really know what that cost is. I need to make sure it matches with the ROI, what I'm trying to do. Sure, I can, I can jump in. Um, I think in staff comments, it talks about our multimodal reserve account. Um, mm -hmm. That's up to the board to decide um, how that works. And typically, it would be a linear foot cost is what we've seen. Or essentially, we would ask your designer to provide us a cost estimate for that sidewalk for the entire frontage. And that would be how it worked out. So that in lieu of you actually building that, you're providing the funds to go towards kind of a broader picture or master plan uh, for, for the sidewalk network in town. And I would say for your, uh, for your follow-up application, you can decide what you want to do and simply put it in there. Uh, you could request that the board uh, uh, accept the uh, donation to the multimodal um, or indicate that you're going to put in a sidewalk, basically. That's, th those are your options. So that can be uh, determined in your next submission. Okay, can that's fair. Can everybody hear me? Yep, hi, Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Gabboys. I guess what Cheryl's trying to figure out is there a fee per foot for for the fee for, and the other fee for the sidewalk? Because, you know, obviously it's not practical to build a sidewalk where it leads to nothing. So what would the fee be? Is it so much per foot? Well, we'd want to see, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Can I, jump, I don't need to jump in. Yes, please, that. jump in there. I can't help myself. <laughs> it would, um, we'd essentially, Paul, if you could provide a, maybe in the next submission packet, a cost estimate for the cost to build a sidewalk for the entire frontage for the, the three lots. Okay. And then we would evaluate that to make sure, essentially, that I would have enough money to, to say, do a town project and provide that kind of sidewalk. You know, essentially, we're not looking to, to make money on this. We're looking at, you know, to, to balance out that cost. So you're, you're, it's the same cost either way, whether you're building it or you're not building it, I guess, essentially. No, I, I understand. I didn't, know if you, <laughs> I didn't know if you had a set fee or you wanted to come up with a cost estimate. Yeah, I think if you provide a cost estimate, we can talk about it. We can evaluate that. And you and I can go back and forth and make sure that makes sense. Um, okay. Okay. Yep, thank you. Okay, thank you. Sounds good. Um, and the six trees, uh, the two per lot, that, that makes sense. So we'll include that in our next packet submission as well. Um, did you want to speak through to the requested waivers as well, Jamal? Um, I think I mentioned it during my overview, um, but you're requesting a waiver for stormwater management and traffic analysis, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, we did get some feedback on the traffic per trip fee uh, from Bill Bray. You included that in your, mm -hmm. in, in, so does that suffice for that as well? I think staff's generally comfortable with that. Yep. Okay, that's fair. For traffic. Mm -hmm. And for stormwater, Paul, did you want to talk and speak to that a little bit? Uh, yes, uh, Angela, I'm just wondering, I mean, am I doing pre and post analysis for the existing culverts along the road or I'm just going to propose a culvert to match the downstream culvert immediately adjacent to our project. Um, Angela, would you please <laughs> assist? <laughs> um, I guess I would appreciate seeing that those culverts um, are sized adequately um, and they're not undersized and then you're adding more flow. So we'd want to make sure that is accommodated. I'd also yeah, would like some sort of analysis to show um, if, if you are adding flow to the ditch line. Um, those, those ditch lines can be problematic, as you've seen probably around Scarborough with standing water. Um, so I would be cautious, <laughs> I guess, to, 
to cause more issues for our public works crews in the maintenance of those those ditch lines. So I just wanna make sure um, we have some information at, so that we can see what's going on and you can see that the infrastructure can accommodate what you're proposing as well as providing something around those, um, you're adding impervious area is that talking about like drip edges around the buildings, things like that. Something to offset that would be helpful um, as well as confirming the infrastructure sizing that you have out there or what you're adding to it. Um, does that Good. make sense, Paul? Makes perfect sense. Thank you, Angela. Okay. okay. Um, on the remaining elements, um, didn't have any, any issues um, recommending the uh, added location of the, the proposed driveway for lot three. We're happy to do that as part of the next submission. Um, same with working with the police department on the required street addresses. I will continue, I'll work on that. Um, for draft homeowners association documents, um, we don't, I, I don't really have any plan to have an HOA assigned to it. Um, so let me see. Uh, so I'm not really sure. I, I don't really have any intent on an HOA document. I don't know why that would be required. Needed further clarification, please. Um, one of the things that might come out of your stormwater analysis, if Paul shows that you're, you're adding um, some flows and needs to slow that down, you might actually have a stormwater facility that you might need to put in, whether it's minor or not. It would have to be maintained, and that was where a homeowners association would come in. So that's just one aspect I could think of as a reason, but I don't know if there's others that's, and, and maybe it, there isn't at the end of the day, but that's um, something as you work through the project, you might you might come to something that, that makes sense, or maybe it doesn't. Okay, so again, I'll work with Paul on that. If there's any questions, that's Angela. I can, I can chat with you. Um, let me see, uh, recreation contribution fee per unit, uh, understand, makes sense. I guess that's part of the approval process for payment. Um, uh, the, the documents from the sanitary district and water district, I will be sending along, I've already sent along the um, sanitary district uh, approval. I'm still working with the water district on that, but that should be available before our next meeting. So I'll submit that to you guys. Um, and a response to comments was the last, and of course that will go into this next packet for your review. Okay. Does that address anything or are there for any further okay. questions? I think and Angela has a comment. <laughs> Just one more, okay. we were talking about the sewer and water. I know like you had mentioned, there's now a low pressure force main in, in Sawyer Road. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that the sewer district just provided stubs for the locations that were immediately connecting. So I'd want to make sure when you, not just getting a capacity letter from the sewer district, you're actually getting them kind of signing off on the fact that you're going to have three services in there and how, and yeah, how you connect into Sawyer Road. My understanding is it's in the ditch line, so you shouldn't have to get in the road. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more than just one, one stub, you know what I mean? So I just want to make sure you have a full conversation with the district and not just a capacity letter. Sorry. <laughs> that you. will be my next plan of attack. But yeah, I, I, my understanding was it, at first we needed to look at capacity. So that's fair. Is there anything else? You've been very thorough. I've tried, <laughs> trying to learn. Thank you. Um, that's what I have for the feedback from from Jamal. So as long as we're on the same page with what needs to be done for the next submission, I think we're in good shape. But you guys tell me. This uh, this is subject to a, a public hearing. So if there is any member of the public, we have. Uh, throngs in the back of the room here, uh, and dozens online, I'm sure. Uh, do we have, uh, if you have um, a member of the public who would like to make a comment, please, uh, and you're online, please raise your hand. Scrolling through, I see no hands. All right. <laughs> <laughs> then I declare the uh, public hearing over.
Um, I, before I turn it over to the board, I do have one suggestion under the site access. Staff recommends that the applicant include the location and associated details of the proposed driveway. Usually uh, when we're looking at developments where there is a lot of wetlands, we also request that the, um, the applicant delineate the actual limits of construction. So you, even with only one house, you might want to take a look at that. Anybody, okay. uh, anybody else on the board? Comments? Questions? Yes, question. I have actually a question for staff. Um, does this, just out of curiosity, does this have to be proposed as a subdivision or could this be broken into three separate lots? Uh, subdivision by law is three or more lots three in a five year period. Oh, okay. So right. it triggers okay. subdivision law. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Um, I have no other questions. Okay. All right. Uh, you're all set. Um, if you have any questions, I encourage you to talk to the staff. Uh, as you've heard tonight, they're very knowledgeable. They can help you work your way through a process that sometimes seems a little mysterious. So Thank I you. will. I will see you. We will see you again in a month uh, whenever you can get your new application in. Thank you. Thank you. All right, for the members of the audience and the board, we will take a five minute break. <clears throat> uh, five, min five minutes from whatever time your watch says now. Thank you.
Order. Uh, the next item, Crossroads Holding, LLC, request a subdivision amendment review, the seventh amendment, for the Innovation District subdivision at the Downs, Assessor's Map U53, lots 1 to 55. Jamel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the applicant's proposing to combine lots 10, uh, lots 15 through 25, and 36 through 45 into one lot uh, consisting of approximately 24.6 acres. The proposal also includes a new cul-de-sac turnaround at the end of Innovation Way. So staff had a few pretty minor comments. Um, one of them was related to um, lot 46 that's already been developed and lot 35 um, appearing to have full access along Innovation Way. And staff has recommended the applicant provide information to the board um, related to the potential need and use of the 50 foot wide private right of way associated uh, with these specific lots. Staff also recommended that the applicant uh, provide an updated landscaping plan um, for Innovation Way, uh, given that the end is proposed to be modified. And finally, staff did provide uh, the board with the draft motion this evening. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. And for the applicant? Uh, thank you. Good evening. Uh, Dan Bacon here with Crossroads Holdings. Uh, it's nice to be back here in person. I um, guess I'm also kind of running a Zoom, too, so it's a, a hybrid pivot back into to meeting with you. Um, as Jamal indicated, this is a, a lot consolidation. Uh, the board's seen a number of these. This is obviously the, the largest of lot consolidations for the Innovation District. Um, but we're seeing a lot of different end users of all shapes, sizes, and types. Um, we're really excited, or the team's really excited about this consolidation and the end user. Uh, unfortunately, we have an NDA at this point, and we can't uh, reveal who the end user is, uh, but the end user is gonna be a great fit for the innovation district. Obviously need uh, a lot of space within the district for for initial plans and growth, um, and we think it's gonna be a great asset to the town. Um, as with kind of every process, um, we're first taking this lot consolidation uh, subdivision amendment. It's a, it's a requirement of the sale, um, and as soon as that uh, occurs, then we, we're hopeful and excited that the end user will be in front of the board uh, for site plan review in the near future. So in terms of, let's see here, Drew, the consolidation. Oh, arrow, different laptop. Um, I think as the board is well aware, this is the current Innovation District uh, subdivision plan. It shows the lots uh, Jamel indicated would be uh, merged into one. So this is the, the amended subdivision plan. So um, currently, Innovation Way goes all the way to the end of phase three of the project. Um, and so what this would do, would, it would consolidate all of the lots in phase three. Uh, a few lots are at the, the easterly edge of phase two. And then terminate Innovation Way as a cul-de-sac as opposed to, uh, to a hammerhead turnaround, which is the prior design. Um, we think that works quite well for um, both access to the lot, um, but also general use of Innovation Way um, for trucks, for cars that are driving down Innovation Way to have an easier time of turning around and heading out of the project. Um, so that's a primary change um, with the amendment is to, to include a cul-de-sac. Um, another thing this amendment does, it actually uh, takes the, the stormwater ponds that were planned for phase three um, and includes them entirely within this lot because those ponds will only be serving this one, this one lot owner. So there's not a reason to have the ponds um, in association property um, and that was included in the amendment. I think the other kind of two key pieces to the amendment, um, one of which uh, staff comments asked about is this 50 foot wide right of way, um, which connects uh, the cul-de-sac down to the open space. As the board likely remembers um, in Innovation District, uh, there's an open space band, uh, 100 foot buffer, an open space area that runs around the easterly, uh, the southerly, the easterly, the northerly end of the Innovation District. Um, so that open space, 
includes trails, um, not only for innovation district in the downs, but also to provide a connection to Warren Woods, which is to the east of the site. So um, with our prior or current subdivision, we're providing trailhead parking and a trail connection to uh, that open space to Warren Woods. We want to maintain that, um, but adjust where it happens. So this 50 foot wide um, right of way would provide that space um, for a, a driveway, for trailhead parking, and a trail connection to the open space. That's why it connects past uh, lot 46 all the way down to the open space. Uh, the specific design of that, um, um, we've discussed with staff and, and the end user, uh, the design of the trailhead parking and the trail um, can be reviewed through site plan review and coordinated with the site plan. So it's not shown on the plan. Um, but it's committed to uh, both by us and by the lot buyer. Um, I think in addition, uh, I think the only other final comment was we actually didn't show the street trees um, within the right of way, really thinking and, and planning for some flexibility and driveway locations, um, but we're happy to work with staff on adding those street trees um, per the same spacing we have on Innovation Way so that the entire right-of-way has street trees um, and just kind of work around, you know, through site plan where the driveways come in um, to not, to not um, con conflict with those street trees. Uh, so I think with that, those are the, the kind of the key points. Um, and both Rocky Rosbera from the Crossroads team and Drew Gagnon are here if there's kind of more detailed questions. Um, but I'll stop there and, and respond to questions if the board has any. Thank you. This is subject to public hearing. I don't see anybody immediately in the room who wants to speak yet. Uh, Angela, is there anybody online? <laughs> right here. All right, thank you. Uh, in that case, uh, we'll, the public hearing portion is over. I'll turn to the board. I do want to make one remark uh, as a preface. Given the size of this, I've talked uh, with Jamel about the probably, probable need to hold a workshop, as we've done in the past when there have been uh, large projects coming before us, that it's very likely that that would be a very fruitful thing to do once... Um, once you can reveal who the, uh, who the new folks are, um, I think it would be good for us to, to all get together and, and take a look at this. It is a very large uh, amount of land. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know what's going on there, but I'm excited because it's gonna be something big. Um, so I, we will set up that workshop, but I will now turn to the members of the board. Uh, do you have any questions? We wouldn't need a workshop if it's gonna be a solar field. I just want to be on record for saying that. <laughs> yeah, the only question I have, and it's just purely, and I know you can't answer it, but I'm just going to throw it out there anyways. Uh, on your um, WQ sheet, um, you show approximately approximate location of anticipated buildings, and they look like relatively three small buildings on this large lot. <laughs> Which plan sheet is that, Roger? This, maybe that's a oh, water quality map. <laughs> oh. Drew, do you have access to that? Yeah. Can you respond to that? You shouldn't have put, that, you shouldn't have put those on me. <laughs> Drew Gagnon with Coral Palmer. Um, to answer your question, those are actually left over from the previous main DEP permit that basically those three buildings were tributary to a forested buffer. And that is still, without changing any DEP permit, uh, that amount of roof area is still tributary to a forested buffer, so it was left on there. Oh. Um, it was anticipated location as part of the main DEP, per main DEP permit, and it still is to this. So it's just uh, graphically showing a roof area that's tributary to that stormwater facility, So because we're not touching anything relative sure. to that. Under Great, thank you. thought you figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Jen? Um, I'm I'm sorry, I don't have anything serious to say. No, I don't have any other comments. Um, other than just to reiterate the comment from uh, Woodard and Curran about sizing utilities, which I'm sure you'd be looking at anyway. Uh, but I thought that was a good nod for, particularly for a large lot consolidation. Aside from that, I'm all set. 
Uh, I have uh, I have one question. Do you, do you anticipate the entrance to that site will be uh, off of the circular, the circle, the cul-de-sac, or off of Innovation Road in the uh, the area next to Lot 26? How do you how do you anticipate an entrance to that lot? We're anticipating it to be off of the cul-de-sac um, in, in some location. Yeah, not prior to the cul-de-sac. That, that's what you're referring to. Okay, so but, around the circle someplace. All right. Yeah, I mean, we haven't, the, the end user hasn't gotten to detailed design, so I don't want to speak for them uh, quite yet, but that's what we're anticipating. All right, thank you. If there are no further comments, I have a draft motion. I move to approve the project title Seventh Amendment Amended Overall Subdivision Plan proposed by Crossroads Holdings LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Goral Palmer dated 6-28-21 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the proposed Seventh Amended Subdivision Plan includes the combination of lots 10 15 to 25 and 36 to 45 into one lot consisting of approximately 24.6 acres. The proposal also includes a new cul-de-sac turnaround at the end of Innovation Way. The subdivision is located within the Crossroads Plan Development, CPD, zoning district and is further identified in the Town of Scarborough tax maps, maps as map U53, lot 4. Conditions. Prior to the signing and release of the final subdivision plan, the applicant shall update the plan set to include A, additional information related to the potential need or use of the 50-foot wide private right-of-way associated with these lots, B, an updated landscape plan for the modified portion of Innovation Way. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Two, all other relevant existing conditions from the July 22nd, 2019 Planning Board subdivision approval will remain in effect. Is there a second? Second. Any comments or amendments from the board? Can I ask for clarification maybe on um, yes. 1A when we're talking about because I don't know if it was clear and I think we were looking for a little direction from the board. Um, the 50, use of the 50 foot right away, I think it was the intent of that was looking at lots 35 and 46 and how they may or may not use that 50 mm. foot right of way. And so we were looking for information, but I want to make sure the board is fine with the information that's provided because I don't know what that will be. And I think the intent was, is it for future access through the 50 foot right away for those lots? Is it just utility access through those lots? Because there might be a lot going on. Um, there could be an access point from lot 25. There could be utilities. There's obviously trail parking, which is noted already. Right. Um, I don't know what the intent was for, say, lot 35 hasn't been developed. The lots, yet. not the trail access, but also right. the lots rights to use. Because yeah. I think that was written in the narrative that lots 35 and 46 would have full rights through that 50 foot. I think that was where that that comment came from. Mm -hmm. And so I guess want to make sure whatever they provide that the board is okay with that. Like either way, I, uh, staff doesn't have any comments about that. I just want to make sure you understand what you're voting on or maybe you so can clarify. So they currently, both lots currently have rights within 25 feet of that 50 foot wide right away because they have okay. a 50 foot wide right away in the subdivision plan today. We're just shifting it over. So they're going to have access and utility rights within it under today's subdivision, and that will also um, be under the proposed subdivision, if that helps answer the question. Does that make sense? Does, does the board, is the board clear, or does the board uh, want more clarification? So in other words, you're shifting the 50 foot right away towards this lot, 25? Is that what it's going to be? We're adding a 50-foot wide right-of-way. Right here. There is one today, and there's overlapping rights within it to those two lots that Angela is referring to. I shouldn't have, say, I shouldn't have said shifting. We're adding a 50-foot wide right-of-way. Um, so so be, essentially, it'll be 100 feet. 
Uh, now I need clarification. <laughs> yeah, I don't see the 100 feet. It, the, what's, what's in place today, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, is similar to some of the other shared access points. Like, for example, I'm looking at your sheet. Um, one, oh, S, S1, where you're showing the, the shared, so it's sort of the split access ways that we looked at for mm -hmm. between um, like lots 28 and 29 and 26 and 27, is that right? Where we looked at, um, so that's where each property had access to the, the 25 feet. Correct. Closest to yep. the other one. Yep. So was that, so I think what you're saying is that was the case here, but now because of the lot con consolidation, it's going to sort of a more traditional straight 50 foot right of way. Is that right? That is right. Um, and it's also going all the way to the open space because prior on the current subdivision plan, it only goes halfway down Got through it. lot 46. Yep. Okay. So therefore, the, we didn't have a trail connection. You know, that got to the open space. So that's why it is going mm -hmm. that distance. Um, and the intent is to provide that trail access, but also maintain those access and utility rights for those two lots within it. So I, I think you just answered my question. You're saying there is potential that like lot 46 or 35 could come out into that 50 foot yes. easement. I mean, 50 foot right of way that you're creating now, but they would go through a site plan process for this board to approve whether or not that access is happening. Yeah. Okay. Does that? It's fine. I, I, it, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable. So it seems like that that might not even need it in the motion, but I just wanted to make sure that was clarified then. Thanks for helping <laughs> me talk that through. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no further questions or comments, um, Doreen, you please call the roll. Mitchell Hendrickson? Yes. Roger Bealy? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Rick Mankin? Yes. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so when are we going to know? As soon as we can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, on to the next one. Remember that uh, item number nine has been tabled. Number 10, Front Runner Park Condominium LLC requests a site plan review for lot 40. Within the Town Center Residential Subdivision, Assessor's Map R52, Lot 4. Jamel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so this project's located within the Town Center Residential Subdivision on, lot, on the proposed Lot 40. Um, the applicant's proposing to construct three 12-unit residential condo buildings and six garage buildings. And as noted in the review memo, in accordance with state statute, uh, Title 30A, Section 4402, Subsection 6, uh, the board authorized the utilization of the site plan review standards as a governing standards for reviewing multifamily developments going forward. So this project will be reviewed utilizing the town's site plan review ordinance instead of the subdivision ordinance. Steph would also like to note that the board will not be able to take any final action on lot 40 um, until the lot has been officially created as part of the uh, subdivision amendment process for the subdivision. So staff has recommended that the applicant provide some buffering along the eastern property line uh, between the proposed garages and the single family home lots um, to the east. Staff has also recommended some placemaking elements within the central green area between the proposed condo buildings and adjacent to the main entrances to the proposed buildings as well. Staff has also noted that the side and rear elevations of the garage buildings do not appear to have any windows or fenestration elements, and the commercial design standards require these ele elevations to be designed to complement um, the treatment on the primary facade, and has recommended additional windows or fenestration along the side and rear elevations to help soften uh, the appearance. Staff would also like to note that the town's traffic consultant has expressed concerns related to the proposed location for the proposed driveway along Pacer Pacer Way, um, and during this during this review, his review of the fourth amended overall subdivision plan, uh, so the applicant should update the board on any necessary revisions to the driveway location uh, based on these concerns. And I believe that Angela would like to speak to some of the stormwater management 
proposals on the site. Thanks. Thanks. Um, this lot, um, I know I've talked through with Goral Palmer already. Um, the stormwater analysis that's provided is really an overview for the subdivision that basically went through DEP and is actually dated from February. So as things are progressing, um, it's it's not aligning with the lots that we're talking about. So for myself and Wooder and Curran to to really go through in the stormwater analysis, um, it's it's getting more and more difficult where the analysis shows lots one through 13. We're talking about lot 40, those type of things. <laughs> so um, to that point, we have reached out to Drew. We talked about um, probably having a staff meeting with Wooder and Kern to kind of sit down and go through some of this so that we can maybe move forward um, trying to streamline how, how we review the stormwater analysis a little, trying to clarify things. I think it's getting a little muddled at this point, um, just trying to decipher just because it's moving so fast, um, like I said, lot numbers, how we align, are we looking at this, are we looking at that, it's getting very confusing. Um, and so trying to track the stormwater pieces is getting very complicated. So with that said, I think uh, more review needs to be done, I will say on this item as well as the next one, because um, I think the our peer reviewer and myself um, are struggling a little bit trying to, to, to really get into the weeds here. So I just wanted to throw that out. And, and that we are working with Goral Palmer to kind of rectify that, try to get past that and, and make sure we're clear on what is being proposed and where it's going, stormwater. Thank you. Jamel, did you have anything else? I'm all set, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, this is subject to a public hearing. Um, I see nobody in the room ready to jump up uh, for the hearing. Is there anybody online? There is nobody online, therefore the public hearing is over. I, and I will turn this over to the board. Rick Meinking, what you got to say? I think the applicant wants to present, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. It's okay. No, we don't need that. Let's just move on. Uh, all my questions, I don't have anything to I think hey, Angela answered everything that basically I had on my list. So uh, but I'm sorry, Dan, go ahead. I'll make my presentation brief. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I do have a master plan up uh, on the screen just to orient everybody. We're working on updating the master plan. I know that was talked about the last meeting. Um, we're close to having that for you. We're still integrating the new downtown plan. So I didn't want the board to think we forgot about that. Um, we're gonna provide that very soon. Um, as an aside, um, Jamel and Jay and I have talked briefly or corresponded briefly about having a workshop sometime soon. Um, I know Russ would benefit, he's not here this evening, but benefit from kind of an overview. But also, um, I think the board would schedule allowing to, to enable us to kind of walk through an updated master plan, reveal some of the downtown plans. We've been working with a different committee, but we want to make sure um, we're updating the planning board and to also talk about our transportation and traffic permitting. So we have sort of these larger kind of macro things um, we'd like to work with you on. So I just wanted to mention that before I jumped into the to more of the details of this application. Um, to orient the board, this particular um, site plan is in this location here uh, uh, on the plan, and the next application is really adjacent to it. So it's um, been designed in tandem, really, with the townhouses that you approved not too long ago. Um, and this site's being designed in tandem with the apartments, which is the next agenda item. So quickly, this is the master plan you've approved in the past. Uh, this blue outline outlines the location within the project. So this is really kind of in the heart of the town center residential uh, neighborhood um, that we've branded Front Runner Park and um, is therefore Front Runner Park condominiums. So the condominium association actually will include what's proposed, but also include the townhouses that were previously uh, approved and are starting construction because of the shared infrastructure involved. So um, to keep you on your toes, I'm orienting uh, this differently, or Drew's orienting this differently. Um, 
and northwest versus east-west. Um, so outlined in black is, um, is this site. So it's a 36-unit um, condominium project. Again, the townhouses are just to the west, so the left on the screen, um, and also to the south. And we've been designing this in an integrated fashion, so we're sharing driveways, sharing alleys, being deliberate about how people come into the project, um, get to parking spaces and garages, orienting garages towards each other and, and buildings towards each other. Um, and so there is one primary access point um, that's entirely on this site, um, proposed off of Pacer Way. Um, and then there's a shared access drive with the townhouses and also a shared access drive with the apartments to try to consolidate access points and curb cuts. We're also equally working hard to have a consolidated and a, and a, uh, a network of walkways. So we're thinking about these sites really as one, um, but they need separate approvals because this is under separate ownership um, from the townhouses, from the apartments. Um, related to that, um, we're, we're working quite closely on sort of designing this with complete street principles in mind. Um, so Drew's going to talk a little bit later about the driveway location, making sure that's safe, making sure that's good, has good sight distance. There's um, the peer reviewer, I know Jamel uh, met with Drew about that. Uh, that access point, again, is the only one to this site that's independent of the others. It's on Pacer Way, um, and it's kind of halfway between um, two kind of tighter curves that we're um, designing for kind of the slow traffic uh, for those complete street principles. And we think we have some ideas around how to maintain good sight distance, particularly looking uh, to the east, so towards the curve on Pacer, um, without obstructions, without kind of change, dramatically changing the site plan, um, and to maintain that as a full access point. So we have some ideas on how to make sure that's, that's safe, uh, meets uh, safety standards and good site distance, but also um, can stay generally in that location. So in terms of um, kind of the feel and the character of this condominium uh, project, these units and buildings are somewhat similar to, to the ones um, we proceed with in the first phase of the project, or excuse me, town center residential, uh, the Tandem Court. Uh, units in the gables, um, similar floor plans, but we varied the architecture. Um, all of those units have sold or are under contract, um, so these are very sought after units. So we wanted to, to maintain a similar model, but also create a different, um, it's really a different kind of neighborhood here and a different look and feel. So these units, as opposed to addressing the street, they actually create a courtyard. Um, so they address each other. Uh, the short end of the buildings are closer to the street, really for scale reasons and to kind of fit the site well um, because they're next to smaller buildings. So we didn't necessarily want large buildings with a long facade facing the street. Instead, um, we've created this kind of horseshoe shape. There's a center courtyard um, that we intend for placemaking. We're actually, instead of benches, we're exploring Adirondack chairs, a more kind of informal uh, gathering space. There's a few different opportunities for those in the center of the green. Um, and also this courtyard green that we've designed uh, with these buildings ties directly into the townhouse uh, green that's in front of the six townhouse units closest to the site. So um, they're the same condo complex. They're also going to have the same kind of green Greenway from Pacer Way and the cottage uh, units that are across Pacer Way to the south all the way up into uh, this 36 unit complex. So we've designed that pretty uh, quite intentionally to kind of create that sense of place in this cluster of buildings that face each other and then have garages on the periphery, uh, garages that correspond with the garages to the townhouses uh, that are to the, to the west and then garages that actually we think provide a nice buffer to the single family homes that are on Pacer Way to the east. Um, and we can kind of talk about landscaping and, and um, fenestration of those a little bit later. Uh, our thinking is to 
actually add landscaping along the property line with the single family homes um, to, to break up the, the long walls of the garages versus windows. Uh, we kind of want to keep backyards private for those homeowners. So we're concerned about adding windows that kind of stare from the garages into the backyards, but totally understand the need to kind of break up um, the, the look of the garages from backyards. So we're thinking a landscape approach uh, that's along that property line can, can achieve that goal. On the ends of the garages facing the public street, particularly Pacer, um, I think it's a good idea to add a window or kind of some fenestration there so we can do that um, and have the architecture kind of tie in with uh, the condo buildings. Um, so that's a high level kind of overview of the intent with this layout um, and our goals for it. As you can see, the um, before I turn it over to Drew on some of the engineering details, um, we're going with kind of a, a New England design, certainly, um, with kind of the gable roof. The colors aren't showing up quite right in this graphic. Actually, it's, it's uh, more of a beige. I think it's like a, a maple. I'll get you the right name. But it's uh, a maple siding with clapboards on the first three stories. The gable ends have board and batten. And then like a kind of a grayish um, center element for the, the middle of the, the units, where the entry is, where the hallway windows are. Um, that we think, again, it provides a different look and feel, um, but also follows kind of a good blueprint for uh, floor plans and the, the two bedroom units that have been popular in the past uh, phases. So each building would, would match. Um, we'd have red windows to provide a nice accent um, and have the garages uh, correspond with the architecture of these buildings. So with that introduction, I'm gonna let Drew talk about some of the more uh, design related components. Thank you, Dan. Drew Gagnon with Goral Palmer. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a little bit more of the details associated with this application here. Um, so, right now, we're looking at the zoomed in site plan of the lot. Um, and as Dan mentioned, we have the buildings oriented around a common green area with a horseshoe uh, shaped feeling and look to it right in the center with the garages on the outside of that. Um, so each one of these buildings uh, that Dan mentioned is very similar to the Gables as well as Tandon Court, which was previously approved uh, with some slightly different design changes, um, but floor layout and two bedroom versus one bedroom unit splits are essentially the same. So we're looking at 11 two bedroom units, one, one bedroom unit per building. Um, and then the garages are on the outside that, um, as you can see on this plan, so like Dan mentioned, up against the residential or future residential lots on the east side and then loaded up against the alley of the townhouses at Front Owner Park on the left side. Um, so this provides 36 covered and garaged units, which is essentially one per unit. And then each unit also has a tandem parking space right in front of it that can be shown on this plan. Um, we did this tandem parking at Tandem Court, which was previously approved uh, about a year ago. So in addition to that, some supplemental overflow parking along the drive aisle on the right-hand side of the screen here. Briefly with the utilities, um, we have water services and fire services coming from Pacer Way. Um, and then sanitary sewer is coming from a previously approved stub, which is a private stub along the townhouses at Front Runner Park, right on the west side of the plan by the mouse here. Um, that's providing sewer gravity sewer, sewer service from each building down to Route 1. Um, electrical is coming from Pacer Way as well as from Access Drive up here near Lot 41. And then gas services are com coming from previously approved stubs as part of townhouses at Front Runner Park as well as a stub from Pacer Way. So kind of everything surrounding development uh, where available and infrastructure is where we're grabbing that from. Um, this is kind of a quick stormwater overview and I do want to mention real quick and I appreciate Angela's introduction of this. Um, so as we get into the downs more and more, um, we keep adding layers to the stormwater uh, management plan as well as the entire infrastructure. So we pre-permit, if you will, these developments um, ahead of time to DEP so that we just can have concurrent reviews and as we're expecting our DEP permit, we come in with site plan and town approval. Um, so in between those times, which Angela mentioned, the stormwater report being done in February, lot numbers have changed. 
Um, that's just simply we don't have the exact number of lots when we're going into DEP, and we eventually come in with more single family. Um, we have a good idea, but that's where the lot numbers, rather than guessing them and guessing them wrong, we typically just start them over from DEP terms to, to try to keep things simple. What that hurts is right now when <laughs> we add on the lot numbers from the previous proof subdivision phases and they don't line up. So I certainly understand how that's a little bit confusing um, and we're certainly happy to walk through that in a staff meeting um, and provide Angela and her team exactly what she needs from a stormwater report, um, scorecards, uh, water quality plans. Um, so I do wanna mention all this has been allocated um, per the permit. It's just a little bit tough to follow. So I'm certainly happy again to walk through all that and, uh, and show where all the land allocation is coming from. Um, it's just a matter of what's considered future area in the first permit and not in this permit. So again, happy to walk through that. Um, so with that said, most of this site does go to the proposed gravel wetland five in the southeast corner of the road that is part of the fourth amended town center residential subdivision plan. Uh, a small portion of it, basically just because of grade along the road, uh, along the alley here, goes to the townhouses up front on our park drainage system, which goes over to the first gravel wetland, which is the one already constructed there right now. Um, and then a small portion of this in the southern end of the site does go to an, uh, a planned storm drain infrastructure that actually bypasses the gravel wetland and outlets to the west of that said gravel wetland. So again, all that's been allocated. It's just the lot number's a little bit different. Um, and then when we move lot lines slightly from February to now, um, it can just get a little confusing. So again, happy to walk through that in more detail with Angela and uh, Warden and Kern. This is the proposed landscaping plan. Um, our landscape architect is not here, so I'll briefly go through showing all the trees. Um, we are providing screenings around the transformers. Um, in the top right corner of the lot here is one of the transformers proposed for the northern building. The two southern buildings have transformers coming from uh, the fourth amended transformers. They're shown on that plan and screenings have been shown on that subdivision plan, so it just needs more of a coordination thing. But uh, we do intend on screening all those with low shrubs as we've done in the past. And as Dan mentioned, along with the staff comment for screening the residential, um, there's not a whole lot of room back here. Um, so this is where I thought was to put some trees basically right on the property line. Um, and we want to do that when the lots are being developed um, so that the grades match, because essentially this plan is going to show the grades matching back into the plan grade of the other one, but with the single family lots being developed individually, we wanna make sure that those are just coordinated. So we'd be happy to add a note just confirming um, that street tree, uh, not street trees, but landscaping trees are provided along that edge when the lots are developed to the east. Um, I think that'll work out well for both sides um, and it'll ensure that we're not putting a tree during this development that's gonna get buried from a single family home getting developed. So I think that'll work out for everything. Um, I'm hoping that that's kind of a, a good discussion and a good, uh, a good idea for this development here. Um, so I'll speak, so we got to some of these already. Um, so I'll knock off a couple of these. You want the seating areas, the central green that Dan mentioned, some Adirondack chairs, a little bit uh, different, but uh, if, if we feel like that's gonna create a nice uh, community space in the middle, um, providing some other hardscapes on a revised submission of uh, in that middle there to kind of have those Adirondack chairs sitting on something. Um, Dan mentioned the garage design and updates, so we're providing the trees along the right-hand side, right on the property line, and uh, adding a window to the side of the garages that are facing the public right away. Um, that, like Dan mentioned, providing one on the back, we feel like kind of con contradicts the trees being there um, and providing privacy. We felt that the trees would be more beneficial to the sing uh, future single-family home owners, and but we're happy to provide um, the windows along the southern side of, let me move back up here so we're talking the same thing, on the southern side of the garage down here to meet the, uh, to meet the design standards. Um, we did coordinate with the fire department on July 9th. Um, they're all set with this design. We have some minor hydrant tweaks just to get the fire department connections within 100 feet um, of the risers, but uh, we're all set there. So we did coordinate with them. I just wanna provide that update. Um, as I mentioned before, main DP permit is anticipated in August. So we're basically waiting on that to this point to trigger the other th third and fourth amended subdivisions that are coming forward. So we recognize those need to be approved first before this one. Um, and we are working as close as we can to DEP right now to try to get that 
DEP permit issued. Um, so the driveway along Pacer Way. I do wanna talk about that briefly and Jamel and the traffic, uh, peer reviewed traffic engineer met with me um, a couple of weeks ago, I believe, and we looked at a couple different alternatives for this site um, and we've, we've reviewed and we've gone back and we, we still feel that a full driveway along Pacer is what the development needs and what the development is best for the residents that are gonna be living there. Um, so what this graphic shows is, and this uh, site distance is a little bit it's basically the same site distance that was provided in the package and provided in the fourth amended subdivision. Um, but I just wanna really highlight what, what the discussion point was around and how we think that we can alleviate some of that concerns from the traffic engineer. Um, so this site distance is if you're leaving, which has been the discussion point, if you're leaving the access drive, it's looking left and looking right along Pacer, along the switchback curve. Um, so what I, what I um, wanna point out is that this area right here, we were previously providing as a no build easement across lot 55 right there. Yes, lot 55. Um, recognizing that if it's still owned by lot 55, there's always an opportunity. It's tough to enforce something not getting planted there or, or fences going up that would obstruct views from this driveway leaving. So what we propose is to move this land to lot 40 so that it can be controlled by the condominium association and therefore we have the opportunity to um, remove anything and the, an ability to enforce it through the development rather than relying on the homeowner. So that was, a, that was an idea by the traffic engineer and I do appreciate that and I think that that makes some sense so that from an ownership and an enforcement standpoint, um, we can provide what he's looking for there. So I do wanna mention that the standard we've been following on the downs to date, as well as uh, the town standard is 200 foot site distance for a 25 mile an hour road, which is what our design speed is for this pacer way here. Um, I do wanna mention that it's likely no one's going 25 here with the curve along here, but that is the standard. Um, we are meeting the standard with both, um, with both directions on this site distance. So I do wanna mention that, that there is no formal waiver for the site distance. Um, and that we think that by providing this area in red, essentially right here where the mouse is, um, as part of lot 40 land, we'll be able to enforce and be able to provide a safe um, exit of the vehicle out of this driveway by owning the land and, and maintaining that and not allowing any obstructions to be planted in that. Um, and if you're looking right, this site distance, it cuts across the Esplanade. Um, again, we can control where the street trees are planted, at least during the planning stage, and that's our intent. Um, so there's nothing from this lot 43 down here. Um, they don't have a right to plant in the right of way or put anything. So um, from that standpoint, that's always gonna be available. And that also provides a 200 foot site distance on that side. So I just wanna reiterate, we are, pro we are um, proposing a full service driveway here in and out for the residents of the project. Um, we think it's really important for everyone to be able to enter here and leave without having to go all the way up and around and cut in front of p potentially more pedestrians along the two projects, the, the one they'll see uh, next in front of us as well as this one and trying to relieve and get everyone into the main roads and where they're really designed to go and not uh, putting them through development such as blocking off a driveway or anything like that. So I do wanna mention again, one time we are meeting all the standards with this 200 foot site distance um, and there are no formal waivers with it. It's just kind of walking through it a little bit more and uh, moving that land over to lot 40 so that um, we can control what gets put there. And that's all I have. Uh, I'll turn it back to the board unless Dan has anything remaining to say. So I'll turn it back to the board and thank you very much. All right, uh, now it's the time for the board members. Uh, Jen, do you wanna start off? Uh, yes, sure. Um, Oh, okay, first first of all, as someone who just removed a whole bunch of trees from a place that I'm sure someone planted them on the property line, can you just clarify that you don't actually mean on the property line, but like within the buffer space of that lot? Yeah, I mean, it with the grading that 
the garages are right there. Um, we'll do everything we can to provide a level service right before. So technically, yes, we'll put the trees on the lot like, 40 side. Like on one or in the other. Yes, side. exactly. Not directly on it. I meant the in the space allotted right there. Thanks. So. We literally had some that were like <laughs> on the line. It's annoying. Um, but I like the tree idea. Um, as a buffer. Um, okay, question about the four garages that you show to the west of the three residential buildings. Um, I see that you are, you're showing a series of uh, walkways kind of in between them, but I was just curious about whether there's any um, planned access into those garages from the back. Do you know do you know what I mean? Or is the intent that people would be walking fully around the, all the way around that building and into the front? And again, are these full, um, full garages, like garage door access or more just a carport? Yeah, they are full, um, they have garage doors, they're not carports. Um, typically, there's storage on the back wall of the garages. So at, at this point, our plan has been to, to kind of maintain that so that um, garage owners have that storage versus kind of losing that wall space um, and walking around to, to the overhead doors to get access to the, to the garage. I know it's not a long distance, but I was just curious about, you know, some people, I don't know, may, most of us, if you have a garage, there's typically a secondary sort of person only entrance. I was just curious about that. Um, and then I also noticed that, or didn't notice a bike rack detail in the, um, the plans. And so that got me thinking about these pads that you're showing here at the back of um, the second garage unit. Um, and I just, really wonder or would ask you to consider um, uh, next level bike parking here, for lack of a better term, perhaps something covered, perhaps something more secure than just um, an open air, you know, hoop rack style, given that um, it is so close to the residence is here and, um, you know, it would just allow people to, you know, I don't know, so many of us have bikes and if it's, if it's not sitting in your garage, but you had a secure place to put it, um, outside that was easily accessible not having to navigate it around your car, if you had one, that type of thing, um, where, where it is directly adjacent to sort of an otherwise parking type building, it doesn't, um, seem to me that it would be overly difficult, but I guess I would just ask if you could um, look into that. Okay. Um, a question about the, I'm curious why this one building is angled. Um, the engineer in me is trying to figure it out. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> Uh, there's a couple reasons we angled it. Um, one is we wanted to provide a transition. If you can see this plan, uh, oh, I just, so the townhouses are right here and the townhouses are angled and, and kind of square with Pacer. Um, and we wanted to have this kind of green continue in a similar width coming from the townhouses up into uh, the courtyard for the condos. Um, so we did it for that way, uh, for that reason. We also, when looking at it originally, felt like having this building um, square to this one, you kind of looked at a lot, driving up Pacer, you looked up a lot of that end of the building versus the edge. Um, so those are a few of the reasons. Another reason was to, to kind of create a, maybe a a little bit more interesting space in between the buildings and not necessarily have the windows right across from each other um, for privacy reasons, for different angle reasons. Um, but there was a lot of debate uh, about that 
um, with any number of disciplines, not just engineers. So, um, and this is where we landed. We felt like it kind of gave the green a little bit more breathing room. It kind of opens to the street when you're driving up. It didn't feel as closed in as when it was square. Um, if that helps answer your question. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, and then I guess lastly, the only other question I had, appreciate the conversation. I think it's a good idea um, to sort of secure that, that the land in question, preserving it for sight distance on the corner there. Um, what's your thought, if you have any at this point, and you may not, um, about either enforcing that or reinforcing that. I'm assuming, you know, but suppose safe to assume that anyone purchasing, so the lot 55 would be a single family lot. Is that the idea? Yes. So presumably most people would purchase a lot and then understand what their lot lines are. But, you know, we all know over time, everyone ends up mowing their lawn, you know, as it goes out into the right of way, for example. Um, and I know in other projects here, we've talked sometimes about putting boulders in, in one case um, at the back of a property to sort of reinforce protection of sensitive wetland areas or things like that. So I was just curious if you had any ideas about whether or not you would, and I, I guess I'm really thinking physically, any type of physical reinforcement there, or do you envision that space sort of just becoming effective lawn area for that residential um, lot? Yeah, I think we need to look at a, a clean edge, you know, to define what's open space with the condos versus the lot owner. So, um, and we want to make sure that's not creating a site distance issue, so we need to make sure that's offset from that site distance. Um, but we could do a landscaping treatment or a fence or something like that. We haven't developed that yet. We wanted to float the idea of the board and um, and talk about this area going with the condos. Um, and then we can develop what is that edge to make sure it's abided by. Um, another thing Drew didn't mention, if it's part of the site plan, then any amendment to that space comes also comes back to the board. So it's not only like the association, condo association, but you know, you don't, Condo associations can't just change things also without a site plan that reflects it. So there's another kind of belt and suspender to making sure it's an open space. But we can look at an edge treatment that's effective and making sure it's not encroached on. Okay, thanks. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, Roger. <clears throat> Actually, I, I, I don't have anything. I think they've answered all the questions. Um, the biggest concern was what our traffic peer review uh, had, and um, I, I actually think the um, the the um, those buildings, the way you have them angled, so they were looking at the side of the building on Pesa. I think it looks very attractive. Um, so I don't have any anything further on this. Thank you, Rick couple of questions. I thought you mentioned there was a garage for each unit, but I'm coming up four spaces short. Is that true or am I misinterpreting what you said? Drew's in trouble if he's too short. I got 10, 10, <laughs> and 12. That's 32. And I thought this was 36. There, each one of those garages on the left-hand side are four units each. So that would be 16 on the left and then 20 on there the right. There you go. There you go. That okay. makes up. Uh, my math, I got 12 and 16. What time is it? Yeah, all right. I'm, I'm entitled to a mathematical error. Uh, thank you. Um, but I don't see anything on EV chargers, and I know people with condos are going to want EV chargers. And I know you're putting power in those garages because you're putting lights on them. So there's some potential there to think about. I love the floor plans. I like the openness of the kitchen and dining room and all that makes, makes putting heat pumps a very viable solution for your heating and cooling needs. Um, I wouldn't think that you'd be putting these units up without any air conditioning at all. Um, so consider that as well. Um, on the dumpster, just curious, are you 
intending on having both solid and a recycle container in that, or what's your plans? Yeah, both recycling and solid. Nice, thank you. And um, generally speaking, I, I like the open spaces that you've created here with the the sidewalks and and the interconnectivity between the buildings and the and uh, I had that same question that you had Jennifer about the garages getting to the to the buildings, but I uh, I suppose a good walk doesn't hurt anybody, right? <laughs> Um, I didn't see any prints or anything on any of the drawings where your snow snow uh, load was going to go. Um, is that marked on one of the prints, or did I miss it? Uh, it should have been marked on the site plan. There should be some. I probably missed it, but clouded areas. I'll be looking. I'll be looking for that in the next submission just to make sure that it makes sense. Rocky is telling me C one hundred two. C one hundred two. You're quick, Rocky. Okay. Excellent. Um, I am kind of excited that you don't show any uh, natural gas coming into these. I see fire, domestic service, electrical. Is there natural gas coming into this lot? There is natural gas, I believe, for the hot water, but these do have heat pump units. Excellent, but you know, there's heat pump water heaters, air to water, that are really working great now. You're um, talking to a guy that burns oil. I know, and, <laughs> silly, and I'm talking to the silly guy then because you're paying a lot of money for that oil. But we won't get into those talks tonight. Um, I I think you're you've got a nice little layout. I think they're the one. Uh, part that staff has a little needs a little more information on is how it's going to relate with lot 41 on that out of the parking lot and through lot 41 so I would make sure that in both cases the notes are on both sets of plans but other than that um, uh, that's all I have for for right now R madam chair we're working on the access easements. I think that's what you're referring to, right? Access easements. Easements yeah. between, between 40 and 41 and yeah. how that's all going to pan out. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, Roger, you've got a follow-up, Yeah, right? I, just, I just had another question, and maybe this is directed more to Ronke. Um, how are you finding the, um, the parking in the, um, the previous developments, the, you know, the apartments, condos, et cetera? Is it turning out to be adequate? Uh, phase one, Mill Commons were tight, tight on parking. Uh, and I think we were like right on the ordinance or just slightly above with some of our on street. It's okay. This problem comes when it's time to move cars for snow and, and all of that. Um, and so you'll, you'll see that we're looking for a little more parking in these other residential areas and it's just based on experience. Mm. All right, um, my colleagues have done a good job ticking off most of what I had to say. Uh, I do want to reinforce uh, the appearance of the garage and uh, the concern that, for instance, if I uh, bought a house on, I bought lot 40, 57 for a house, I wouldn't be thrilled with a, a blank wall. Um, so the more buffering that can go back there uh, in between the, uh, the back of the garages um, and the single family houses, I think the better off, the happier people are going to be. They won't, won't be grumbling. Um, I assume, and correct me on this, is the address of these apartments going to be uh, something, something Pacer Way. So that, that's how people will, I, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of guests because this is a complicated sort of parking uh, and interconnected region. Uh, and the residents are gonna figure it out. The guests are going to end up um, in back of the townhouses when they really should be uh, going off of pace away. And, you know, so I, I would caution you to make sure that you have 
really good wayfi wayfi wayfaring findings mm -hmm. that people can get from one place to the other um, because you have uh, a lot going on here uh, and it is mm. not going to be uh, easy for a stranger or a delivery person or whatever to, to figure out um, whether are they at this development or this development or this development. So, yeah, Dan? Agreed. We're reaching out to John O'Malley with the police department to finalize specific addressing, but to your point, um, wayfinding is going to be key and we're starting to develop that system. We also, to Rocky's point earlier, uh, around parking, we're actually provided a bit more parking on site because we had been in other phases relying primarily on the on-street parking um, for guest parking. And since these units don't have kind of that on-street parking given the design of PACER, uh, that's another reason to have kind of clearly marked guest parking and, and additional off-street. All right, thank you. Um, I like the, uh, I, I really do like the interconnectedness. I mean, to me, this this is more of what a, a, a neighborhood or a community is. Uh, I like what you've done extending the open space uh, so that it's seen through Pacer Way. Um, I think uh, putting a uh, gathering place in the middle of the apartments, I gather that's where you're going to be putting something uh, that's, that's needed and it's appreciated. I have no problem with the uh, um, orientation of that one building. Uh, I was intrigued by the thought process that went through to your getting it slanted. Uh, and it does, it will focus people's eyes pretty much directly through to that cross, that crossing place in the center of the development. So think about what sort of a, uh, a view that's going to be as people take a, a really long look into the, into the center of the development. Uh, I think that's a very attractive feature, uh, and I, I will look forward to seeing if, if you're going to be adding anything or how you might consider uh, beefing that up. I, I think you have certainly good landscaping, but um, that view, that long view that you've created becomes visually uh, intriguing for people as they're going by. Uh, the architecture is, is fine. Uh, one of the things I like about buildings uh, is that they all have a storage closet. And as somebody who spent too long in apartments, um, that sort of facility, that sort of ability to have a place to store extra stuff is, is wonderful. So um, I'm very confident that this is going to sell out pretty fast. Uh, the build, the uh, a window at the end of the garage. I think we need that, but you've already uh, indicated a willingness to do that. And I think that may be, uh, yeah, let me ask you, why you, why did you settle on the red trim on the building? Um. We thought the like the beige color with white trim wouldn't go well. Um, and actually, there's a house in my neighborhood that has this color scheme. And it's right next to Charlie's bus stop. So I look at it every morning. And um, it's actually board and batten, too. So uh, I borrowed sort of the, the color scheme. Um, but it's super sharp. And with window trim, um, or I guess sort of the, what's the right term, Rocky? Not the actual window that's red, but the trim around the window is the same color of the siding. So the windows really kind of stand out um, and are quite attractive. And so it seemed like it worked well together. Um, and it took Rocky a while to warm up to it. Tell the truth, Dan. And Brother Bill said no twice, and then finally relented and said, you know, that really does look Cool. I think we should try that. So it's the frame, and the muttons would be would be that red color. And yeah. it, it looks nice in the rendering, so we're we're kind of sold on it. Yeah, I I actually uh, have seen very old houses with that sort of a 
a pop. That's sort of a trip. So I think uh, I think it fits uh, the New England vernacular, strangely enough. Um, and I've heard worse reasons for settling on a color scheme than I've seen the house next to me has it, and it works. So uh, very good. I think uh, you're well on your way. Um, we, of course, have got uh, to pass the subdivision amendments, um, but I have every confidence that that's going to happen. Do you have any additional questions of us for this? We don't. Thank you. I, I just have one more quick question. Okay. I'm, I apologize. Um, can either of you speak to the negative trip, the negative Saturday trips, the 100 and minus 113? Um, I looked at the the traffic scorecard, which looks, um, which is ever so helpful always. Um, and that tallies up a number of other pieces to the overall project that are um, pending approval. So uh, I was just, I was just curious how you arrived at that and then what the plan is. I'm assuming that's, that's indicative of Saturday trips being 113 over what you've been permitted for? Am I, am I understanding that right? Yeah, so there's, the scorecard is based on an interim study that we did and we worked with the board and staff and the town's traffic consultants um, on a town approval of trips and also town mitigation being impact fees um, while we awaited the now infamous uh, TMP, um, which is, very close to being issued. I think the concept plans are being finalized. So we expect to have our traffic movement permit modification by the end of this month, um, making the interim uh, you know, accounting no longer necessary. Um, so that's the, the big picture. The micro is the mitigation that we agreed to uh, with the town um, being the impact fees are based on the PM peak hour. So that Saturday was put in there, um, but it hasn't been like the controlling kind of lever as to what limits us with the, the interim study and how we pay for our mitigation. We pay for our mitigation through paying into the town's impact fees, which is the PM. So we worked with Bill Bray on that understanding um, in the interim, recognizing the the TMP is the real fix, which we should be getting very soon. Thanks. Thank you. And moving on to the last one in plenty of time. Uh, Hackamore Place Apartments, LLC, requests a site plan review for lot 41 within the town center residential subdivision. Assessors map R52, lot four. Jamel. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this project's located on lot 41, uh, just north of the last proposal. The applicant's proposing to construct three 12 unit residential apartment buildings and one garage building. Um, staff has very similar comments um, as the last proposal related to buffering of the garages from the, from the single family homes, um, additional fenestration or buffering for the garages. Um, the driveway location related to site distance. And I don't know if Angela wants to speak again on stormwater, but I believe her comment applies for this one as well. So I think we'll just keep it at that and turn it back to you. Thanks. Thank you. And this time I'll remember to ask Dan to speak. Thanks. <laughs> um, similar to the, the locust plan, I just wanted to show the, the approved master plan. So outlined in blue here is the location of this site plan. So it's um, to the left of what you reviewed, it's planned north. So it, this is just north of the, uh, the Front Runner Park condos. Um, this plan's more helpful. So uh, it outlines the limits of this site. Um, we just spoke of um, the condos here to the south. So, um, so this layout, um, focuses the buildings uh, around a common in a different manner. Um, and it pr it's proposing uh, three uh, apartment buildings. So these would be rental apartments versus condos. Um, these buildings will be very similar to the hayloft apartments that are under construction right now uh, on site, uh, different color scheme. 
Um, two of the buildings will be, interior-wise, will be the same as the hayloft. Uh, one is a modification um, where it provides for more two-bedroom units. It's a slightly longer building um, than the other two. That one is uh, the one that um, runs north-south on the plan, the other two east-west. Um, so it has shared access um, with the townhouses, with the, uh, the condos that we just talked about uh, from Front Runner Way. That access point was approved by the board for the townhouses, but it also will access the, the apartments. Um, and then it has its own kind of full service access onto Hackamore Avenue um, to, the, to the east of where the buildings are. Um, we talked about this a few weeks ago or a few months ago with the subdivision where we've intentionally shifted Hackamore Avenue over, so it's not a long straight road. It's angled. We, had, we made some adjustments um, to work better with the uh, town standards and, and public works uh, right at the intersection, um, but we're able to kind of come up with a good sweep there, uh, really so that this site, as you're looking down Hackamore, is what you look at. You look at green space in the building versus um, more road. Um, and also provide some on-street parking there, and we think a nice kind of green area out in front of the, the apartments for use by the, the residents of the project. Um, so as you drive down Hackamore, there'll be some on-street parking, there'll be a, um, a green. The buildings will front that green, and then to the rear, uh, generally screened by the buildings, will be the, all of the parking for the apartments. Um, we do have an additional garage um, shown here. Um, it, though there are 12 um, garage. Well, Drew needs to check on that. Maybe it's 10. I'm not sure. That, I believe there are 12. Um, and those would be available to 12 of the residents. So not every um, renter can have a garage space, but we thought that'd be a nice amenity. Um, and um, that's kind of a big picture, uh, the layout and, and why it's laid out in this manner. Um, this is uh, a street view kind of perspective of looking, um, obviously looking at the site, looking at the green, really from the intersection um, and across the intersection. Say you were on kind of the southeastern corner of the Radico site. So that item was tabled tonight, um, but this would be the view from some of their green space on the southeasterly corner of the Redico site across to, to this apartment complex. So this green space all matches up well with their green space and their kind of primary outdoor space. It also corresponds well with the green area that's um, next to and, and part of the wetland park. Um, so we've tried to kind of interconnect the walkways and these green spaces to to have a good relationship to each other. We think it has a nice kind of presentation to the street. So um, that's the, the overall kind of design approach. Um, and Drew, feel free to kind of fill in some of the utility and engineering details. Thanks, Dan. I'll go quickly here okay. through just some of the more details associated with Hackamore Place. Um, zoomed in site plan again here, similar to lot. 40, previous agenda item. Um, so we have the three buildings surrounding that common green area here. Um, and I wanna get this right before I get the bedroom count because it is a little confusing. So it is five two bedroom and, one, and seven one bedroom units on these two buildings right here. And the slightly larger building that Dan mentioned is two ten, uh, ten two bedroom and two one bedroom units. So that's the unit split. Um, with the 12 unit garage, it should be a 12 unit garage um, along the eastern side of the property, um, abutting the single family. So same principles there applied from the Front Runner Park condominiums. Utility wise, um, very similar setup where we're coming, uh, bringing our fire and domestic services each independently from the Hackamore Ave water main down across the green and into the site. Um, private sanitary sewer is going to is proposed to connect to uh, private sanitary sewer stuff that was left as part of the townhouses of uh, townhouses of Front Runner Park project. Um, 
just gravity services extending throughout the parking lot and up to the buildings. Um, natural gas service for hot water um, provided to each building from either Front Runner Way or Hackamore Ave and electrical is coming from the electrical stub that was left as part of, or will be left as part of the townhouses at Front Runner Park development. Um, similar comments that I mentioned before with uh, the stormwater, but uh, this site is, is, is the same situation where we're utilizing the proposed gravel wetland five, which is really um, southeast off the page of where I pointed to it on the last presentation. Um, and then a portion of this on the western part of the site is going to gravel wetland one. Um, again, that was, there was a future allocation determined for that gravel wetland. And we're simply just chewing away at that future allocation um, for this site. And then the remaining um, is going to that proposed gravel wetland as part of the fourth amended. Um, we are providing drip edge treatments along the back of the garages and on one and a half of the buildings just to supplement it. That was also included in our DEP permit, just kind of maximizing the roof area that can go to those and alleviate some of the, uh, some of the, the water quality um, sizing of the gravel wetland. So that again, is all included in the DEP permit that we'll happy to spell out a little bit more. Um, landscaping plan here with trees surrounding the um, the walkways throughout the development and screenings around the transformer. Um, so I do want to bring up just a couple of the key updates, comments that we have here. Um, so we do have two benches provided right here and here along the green. I did see a staff comment on that. I just wanted to point that out um, and just, you know, um, point to the couple of benches that we already had provided on there. Um, we did have another question too on the site distance. Um, of the Hackamore Ave driveway. So similar to the first one, although this one also on the inside of a curve is much less aggressive than the previous one. Um, this one we discussed with the traffic peer reviewer when I met with um, him and Jamel. And um, we agreed to this one in principle. Basically, um, I just had to walk him through that there's only one street tree provided within this, you know, front site distance, I'll call it right here, which has been acceptable to date. And we, we it's, we try to avoid the, the rows of trees so you can see where it's broken up in the right of way there. Um, so you don't create that wall when you're looking. Um, so we are providing 200 foot site distance. It does avoid any of the on-street parking there. So that's not blocking it. And looking right, we do provide um, 145 foot site distance. Um, whenever we're up against intersection, we model it as 15 miles per hour. And we've been, uh, on previous phases of the project, we've been going to 115 miles per hour on that side. So. Um, this one again is meeting all the standards and not asking for any waivers. Um, and we feel like this is a good location for it. Um, and you know, we're, we're, we're looking at, is there anything else we can do in this Esplanade to prohibit any obstructions going there? Now it is a right of way, so um, it's tough to do, but we did talk about with the peer reviewer, um, you know, anything additional, either low plantings or something that can chew up the right of way uh, Esplanade to help aid in making sure nothing is obstructing that. So we're reviewing that, um, but we feel good about this design. And again, no waivers provided. Um, no, no waivers are requested through this, uh, this site distance. Um, so the same deal goes with the architecture on these garages. We're happy to add the window on the, in this case, it'll be the northern side of the garage. So right over here to face the right of way to get that, um, provide that same type of um, look and feel that the buildings are providing. And then same thing with the trees along the eastern side, um, providing that buffer to the residential development. Um, we also met with the fire department on this and they're in acceptance of it. Again, some minor hydrant tweaks um, and same deal with the main DEP permit, expecting it in August. Um, so that's all I have for this one. I'll turn it back to the board for uh, comment and deliberation. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, do you have anything else? No, I'm all set. Thanks. All right. Thank you. We'll, um, this is subject to a public hearing. Do we have anybody online? No, then the public hearing is, I declare the public hearing over and turn to the board. Um, Rick, would you like to start? Sure. I think my comments from the last one are germane to this one. Um, Got to ask you, is the red the same red that's on the windows of the last project we looked at? Is it the same color red? I mean, I, I think that'd be kind of interesting. I think it's close. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same. Um, the red, I do believe, is 
I'm in the site all the time, so I don't expect you to know this house, but there's a red house at the corner of the pocket neighborhood that's right on the street. So that's the red, I believe, that this would match. But I'll check on the windows. Well, I just okay. wondered if you threw red there because you're blending it in with the, the red windows of the other, uh, other lot. Um, no, I think this is coming along fine. I think uh, staff has indicated some some additional information needed, and I think it's all within the realm of your expertise. Um, any handicap units? I'm, I'm a little concerned. There's a note that says there's only three handicap parking, and wondered if that's a little low based on the number of parking spots you have, and if you had earmarked some of these units as being handicapped accessible, then you've probably got some dedicated spaces that you're going to need. I need to check on the first floor floor plans. Do you recall, Rocky? They're all, they're all adaptable. Okay. So the entire, the entire first floor floor plans for the So they're all the, the bathrooms and everything are all ADA and yeah. all of that. So maybe we should consider um, reserving some additional handicapped spaces uh, for that. You can put them right next to the EV charger ones if you needed a place to put them. Gotcha. Uh, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Uh, but uh, it's, it's coming along nicely. I think the infill of this whole whole subdivision is looking good. All right, thank you. Um, Roger, you want to go next? Um, actually, I don't have uh, any question pertaining <clears throat> to this because pretty much you've answered your question in the previous presentation for the most part, I believe. But I do, I just have a couple of questions on um, your, stra your strategy. Um, are you seeing a change, maybe this is more directed to uh, Rocky, are you, are you seeing a change in why you're, you're modeling going with um, more two bedrooms than previously, or, or uh, just my imagination? Not, not so much. We, we, we try to be 50-50, um, and it seems like, you know, one month two bedrooms seem hot, and then the next it's, it's one bedrooms. So they're both, you know, people in demand. I, I guess um, I was wondering, uh, <clears throat> has the pandemic changed your modeling? Uh, I think there are there have been more people working from home. We have changed in this style buildings that we're building. We've actually got some space within the units where someone could have a home office, kind of a desk area. Uh, we did adapt uh, a bunch of those floor plans to that. Um, but you know the the mix of ones and twos. You know we try to be about half of each uh, or as close as we can. And, and my other question pertains to your mix of um, rentals versus condos versus townhouses. Is it market research? So we've, we've spent a lot of time on market research and uh, feel like there's a lot of elasticity in the market for both one- and two-bedroom condos and one- and two-bedroom apartments, and so we're trying to build to that. We know that that mix, that style of unit, really doesn't hurt the town when it, you know, when it comes to uh, burden, tax burden. So we're trying to meet that need, and uh, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, need still in the market. Workshop we have on, on the other parts on the next this Wednesday night. They mentioned how many um, kids, school age children. You, you might want to plug that into one of your presentations in the future. Oh, we we have just, uh, just so that that gets talk. reported to the council and and actually gets reported to 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 staff here fairly commonly. Um, but we know exactly where we're tracking with that and okay, we're. And, and my check. last question is: um, um, do, you, do you envision? If you're able to tell us at this point, are you envisioning um, an extension of what we're seeing right now onto Lot 42, which is across the street? That I don't know. Okay. Um, I do see it probably as, as a good portion of it being multifamily, but I'm really not sure what that might look like at this point in time. Jen? Thanks for the segue, Roger. Um, my first question was, what's happening on Lot 42? Are you cheating? Are you cheating off my paper? I saw him look at your sheet. Um, <clears throat> <Secondary. 
Uh, okay, don't know yet. That's fine. And then um, as a result, or the reason that I was thinking of that was looking at this very clear to me anyway, um, line, north to south line that you are providing, a sidewalk connection basically from um, Hackamore Ave parallel to the Easterly building, which connects to the parking lot here. And then in my eyes, there's a big gap across the parking lot. Um, and then you, you know, you've created this other network of um, pedestrian walkways on the project site that we just heard about. And I see how you've, you've sort of designed um, walkways kind of around that. But the reason that I was curious initially about the plans for uh, lot 42 are if you had, if that's residential and you had friends that lived there or it's not residential and it's a store of some sort, that to me just looks like a very strong desire line for folks wanting to get from particularly the the development that we just talked about through this project and then across um, and beyond. And so I raise that for two, two reasons. One, because I think it would be fairly straightforward to add a connection, a defined connection through the parking lot, but of more concern to me actually would be the crossing of Hackamore Avenue mid block right there um, on that corner. So I didn't know if you have thought about that at all or perhaps maybe if you haven't, or maybe if you have, it's, it's, you're thinking about it in conjunction with a lot across the street. Um, but that's just a, it's a pedestrian desire line that kind of jumped out at me in looking at these two projects um, yeah. combined. So a couple of things on that. I mean, this, the, if you're referring to this walkway, right, in front of the building? Yes. Um, this is, really primary to find, you know, get access to that building um, mm -hmm. and to walk out to the green from the parking area. Our initial thought would be if there's a crosswalk across Hackamore, that it'd be at the driveway location um, so that it's not mid-block. Um, but we haven't programmed across the street uh, to know exactly where that should land. Um, but that yeah, would I mean, be our initial. That may work to your advantage to do something like not put a doorway right across that walkway, particularly if you haven't um, developed that. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but right. you could you could probably reinforce that if you wanted. Um, Got it, yeah. Through the, something like that. Um, over here, we've actually, and, and we didn't talk a lot about it on the last site plan, but we've actually provided um, a landscaped edge here, if you can see my hand, um, which provides for snow storage um, or doesn't interfere with that snow storage, but it's just south of that property line so that it's, there's a clear delineation, particularly for parking. We wanted the, we didn't want this parking lot to kind of be in question, you know, whose parking is it? So we've intentionally created a, a landscaped edge here so that that parking is clearly goes with the apartments um, and not invite kind of inappropriate maybe guest parking at the apartments when it shouldn't be there going to the condos. So we've tried not to provide a super strong pedestrian connect connection through that parking lot to the condos for that reason and instead kind of have these sidewalk connections in the condos that kind of loop over to get over to Front Runner to get over to the, to the garages. So we've tried to have connections, you know, between the sites, but not connections that end up kind of working against us in terms of where people park by mistake or um, what have you. Is that, is that where you were headed with? Are we um, talking about the same concerns? Yeah. Yes, okay. definitely. And I, I did not see the, th I didn't see the landscape vision for that, um, b buffering the two projects. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, it's not gonna be like too dominant, but it's gonna yeah. be such that 
you feel like our, this parking lot goes with, with the apartments. Um, I, and I'm just quickly revisiting the parking summary for this lot, um, even though I'm sure it follows the same, you know, t things that we were just talking about, which is you have learned that perhaps a little bit more um, parking is beneficial in these types of developments. And I guess I would just question, is it or how important is it? who's parking where, um, and that you could, you know, build, literally build a path instead of a fence or, you know, a connection instead of a barrier, I guess. Um, if that's, you, you may have other reasons for doing that, but um, particularly if it's not going to be substantial landscaping, like trees or something very tall, you would still be able to see, see, see through there mm -hmm especially if you lived in the building um, to the south. And um, I don't know, I just, I, just I, um, I bring it up in a good way because I think that it's actually what, I think what you've teed up here is um, for whatever reason, it's sort of unusual. And to create a design, such a strong desire line through the middle of a site. Like most often it's all of our developments are sort of pushing people towards the road or pushing people towards the, um, you know, their parking area or whatever it is. But because of your attention to detail with um, the open spaces and green areas around these buildings and the walkways that connect them, um, I'm hopeful that this is a popular place for people to mm -hmm. go, and um, I would that the parking lot just jumped out at me as a gap. So that's um, that's just why I wanted to bring it up. Um, that said, I just say it, said it, but I'll say it again. I love the lawn idea here. Um, you know, I, so many of us have paid our apartment dues at some point or another, or some of us are, you know, renters for life. And I just think that so often doing that means that you have to give up having a front lawn. And that's definitely not the case here. And so I hope that that space is, you know, there's soccer and picnic blankets and, um, you know, families that are gathering out there or friends that are visiting. I just think it's a really, a really great use of space. I was curious about what you were going to do here, um, given the conversations that we'd had about the road alignment. Mm. And I wasn't guessing green space. I was, it seemed like you were going to put some buildings there. Maybe you were. I don't know. But I think this is great. So that's all. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. Um, as usual, my colleagues have uh, pretty much noted just about everything I had. Uh, I want to reinforce again the concern about the, the garages. Um, I believe that that run is over 100 feet, correct? Uh, and um, usually in a 100 feet, 100 foot run of a building, there is supposed to be some sort of features, some sort of distinction, whether you put some board and batting in different places, you know, something that actually breaks it up beyond just the, uh, uh, the landscaping. I, I also note that, uh, I believe staff noted that uh, benches by the doors uh, would be appropriate as gathering space. I, I think the, the, I like the lawn that you have, the green space, but what often happens with apartments and, and even with benches out there is people end up in a line uh, and they're, not, they're only talking to the person right next to them as you start to talk about a gathering place. And I do think you have an opportunity at the L, at the larger end of the uh, lawn, to put uh, some benches either facing each other uh, a small patio, something that encourages people actually to sit down and interact and converse. Uh, benches are great. I saw that you've got a couple. You've got two of them, I think, along the uh, uh, the path in front of two of the buildings. But again, that that 
kind of sets up an isolation, an isolating situation. Uh, so you have the opportunity for a small, real gathering place at that square, at that uh, corner. Um, I like what you've described as your way of gently reminding people uh, what parking area goes with what complex. Um, I can't see anything else that you could do there. You could consider a couple of boulders just kind of to add a feature to it, as long as it doesn't interfere with the, uh, with the snow storage. Um, a, a, a low fence uh, of six feet long, something like that, something that really creates a visual barrier as well uh, and adds to the, uh, uh, adds to the, uh, what you've already got in terms of really a well landscaped design. And that's really all I have. I, I will uh, also remind you about the, the wayfaring. It's gonna be important. I gather uh, this apartment comes off of Hackamore Avenue. Uh, that's going to be the address, correct? Yes. Hackamore? Yep. Okay. So uh, anything you can do to help out visitors and delivery folks would be uh, very helpful. And I do have one final question. Uh, I think it was raised by Roger when he talked about the color red. I'm looking at... Um, not number nine in the index of exhibits. And there, you show the building there, and is that supposed to be red? Or is that brown? It's the building color. It's supposed to be russet red. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't think it comes over okay. too terribly well. Um, so I'm because I thought it was brown and I couldn't figure out what Roger was talking about. <laughs> I think it's Rick. Oh, Rick, I, what Rick was talking about. I could be colorblind too. Well, I, again, I, it's, uh, okay, I mean, the clarity is, the clarity is helpful. I think yeah. the, uh, the printer was not helpful. So um, appreciate the, uh, the information there. That is all I have. Um, does anybody else on the board have anything? Uh, we will see you back here. I appreciate all of the work that you folks have been doing. Um, this whole complex visualized together, I think, is a very different way of looking at things. It's not something I've run across. Uh, so I'm really interested in seeing how that's going to work, how it's going to turn out. Appreciate it. Great. And we'll see you again. Thank you very much. All right, and now on to staff report. Do you have anything? Uh, no, I'll start. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we had a pre we have a pre-construction meeting coming up uh, for the townhouses at Front Runner Park. Um, the comp plan was adopted on June thirtieth, so that's great. And just a reminder of the joint. Town Council Planning Board workshop Wednesday at 5 to discuss a proposed amendment to the Beacon at Gateway project. And staff has been coordinating with the Downs team um, for a general overview traffic update workshop, as Dan uh, mentioned earlier. I think Angela may have some as well. That's all I was going to mention. I know the Transportation Committee is really interested, um, and the Downs team has reached out to us to try to set up that. Um, meeting to go over their TMP, as Dan said. I think they're looking in the next few week, couple weeks um, to have that signed. And I think everyone's very interested to get kind of an overview at least or, or maybe even the details associated with the, all the off-site improvements that are going to be happening around town as well as our traffic impact fees probably going being utilized towards um, also projects at the same time. So it's gonna be, and then the state funds that will be also incorporated in the town. So between the three entities, there's gonna be a lot of transportation projects coming really soon, I would say. Next three years is the big, the big push. So um, I know Jay had mentioned, they had asked about September. Um, but I know we also looked at maybe we could align some schedules to look at 
maybe the, the latter half of August, because I know there's a lot of interest in this. So I'd be interested to hear, you know, where you guys land on that. So. Thank you. Administrative amendment report. Uh, none at this time. Thank you. Correspondence. Correspondence. None. Uh, and planning board. Planning board comments. Roger. Uh, yes, I just. Uh, this is probably directed at. Um, Yes. <laughs> Angela. <laughs> um, how are we doing with Eastern Village and, and, and Dunson, but more, more so with Eastern Village in terms of rectifying all the uh, issues that the people had over there previously? Um, so um, the last thing the board saw was North Village. Um, that got approved, right? Um, and the board approved certain specific list of things that needed to be addressed before the building permit. Those were addressed. Um, as with any development that is stretched out over a long period of time, you continue to find things. So we were continued to add um, to punch lists. I mean, he is, they are progressing on North Village because um, they did meet you know, the letter of the condition so they are progressing, but there is still some cleanup work to do. Um, my next push, and I've been working with our inspectors as well as keeping the developer aware, we're formulating punch lists, so I'm hopeful to get through a street acceptance process for some of the older phases. Um, so that's where the detailed list is coming for, from because there's sidewalks that were constructed you know, eight, ten years ago that now I have to look at and say, we're going to accept these. So there's still some cleanup work to do, but I think we've, they've made a lot of progress, we'll say that. Okay. Um, I, uh, and I didn't know, did you have questions about Dunstan? I, I didn't yeah, uh, make sure there's no, everything's been taken care of down there if there were any issues. But I was, um, I did notice going down Route 1 recently uh, you know where the new, um, where the condos are? I think they're condos, right? On where? Route 1? Oh, you mean at Dunstan? Yeah. Okay, yeah, right, right, right. right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wasn't there supposed to be landscaping between, between Route 1 and that development? Some sort of landscaping? There is, yeah. I'm not sure what the trigger is and when it's supposed to be installed. Because it doesn't um, look too attractive right now. It's just a lot of... Weeds and everything else growing up there, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, weeds and standing water. Um, <laughs> so, I'm not sure what the trigger is. I know it's part of a larger plan development, but we yeah. can we can look into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's it, Angela. <laughs> um, I would just make another plug for the a workshop with the Downs team regarding their. Traffic movement permit, that's something that I've, I mean, I think about that every single time I look through any one of their applications in terms of, okay, this is 36 units. That's 36 cars that are showing up here um, or more, you know, two bedrooms. Maybe it's, maybe it's double that. And then multiplied times each one of their um, their sites, which is fine. There's a lot of very smart people working on it. Um, but knowing, you know, through my own background, what that process has entailed on other projects, nobody knows what it's like on this project because it's so unprecedented. There, I just, I know that there's so much information um, contained within that, that this board hasn't we haven't seen nothing they've hinted nothing to us about other than you know very early on we're going to look at a two mile radius that's that's pretty much it in terms of off-site um work and um so you know i'm very interested in all <coughs> parts of their <laughs> permit i think because that's how i haven't seen it yet <laughs> 
maybe less interested when it shows up on my table. Um, but particularly the thresholds and triggers for doing those sorts of things. So I'm really interested in how, for example, how much more housing are we going to add to the site before we start seeing off-site mitigation to help with some of that traffic. So um, I know that there is a lengthy process for sure, made lengthier by the pandemic. And I know that um, everyone that's been sitting at those tables has been working hard on that. And because we have sort of been um, on the on the fringe of that process, this group here in particular. I just think, I mean, one workshop is certainly good, but it's, I, I know that it's a lot, it will be a lot of information to digest and carry forward with us. And so I anticipate, for me anyway, that taking some time, some, some extra time to go through that, extra time to think about the impact that it will have um, overall around town. And, uh, so the sooner that we can meet with them, I think the better. And looping in the transportation committee is also a good idea. Um, that's all I have on that. Can I? I, I, can I oh, yes, go ahead, Anna. That. Go ahead. Um, I think you're right, Jen, as far as, well, a couple of things. <laughs> this was an unprecedented kind of process. I mean, I think DOT will tell you that they've never had this many scoping meetings for one project. Um, I was at a point meeting weekly with their traffic, just their traffic engineers getting into the weeds. Um, it's been a lot of work. And it is hard to go that far down the road without you guys kind of in the loop, I, I think that's that's difficult. I will put it, I think the process has been though, it's a DOT permit. So we've been kind of the fly on the wall bystander, but kind of chiming in with, well, mm -hmm. think about this, because locally we have this concern. Um, DOT has been really good about listening to that, but at the end of the day, it's not our permit. What we have gotten, I will say, for feedback with certain things that DOT has said, mm, that might, that I hear your concern, but not part of the TMP. You guys need to deal with that on a local level. That's your planning board. You guys can always go to the next, you know, next step on this or that. And there's some very specific things that we've kind of, our peer reviewers have thrown out there for comments um, that we have recognized that it's not our permit. We will bring it up. If it's a concern for the state, then they kind of can incorporate that in. If it's not as concerning for the state, but maybe a local issue, they've been very, very clear on that too, to say, that's what your planning board is for. So you guys will hear, I think we'll, we've gotten the big stuff. It's obviously DOT has gotten the big stuff out of the way. Um, there's always the little threads that I think you guys are definitely gonna have to be a part of. And to your point, because of that, it's going to be the weedy stuff, that it's going to be more than one meeting. Like, and so to your point also, it seems as though there could be sooner a kind of high level, broad brush. I know we did one with council that I, was, I know a lot of you kind of um, probably listen in on or, or were there. Um, we had some transportation committee members there or others that were watching um, when we met with when they did some overview for the council, which was extremely high level. Um, but that's always beneficial, kind of, and then keep kind of working our way down. Because, yeah, I think this is going to be uh, yeah. something you guys have to digest. And for sure. And um, certainly for us, but also, um, you know, the, just the public yeah. in general. I think, you know, there was a recent article in the leader, which was helpful, but. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure anyone here is really can mentally grasp the level of impact that we're in, that we're in for, and I and right. um, that's the point of the TMP is to look at all of that and to understand it. So, mm -hmm. um, yep, I just look forward to. But I guess I just that. wanted to, this board to appreciate the fact that that is a state process, and they've gotten through it with uh, I will say a lot of feedback and participation from town staff. But you guys also have the opportunity. There's also another step here when they come through for this, and it's a local level. So um, I didn't want you guys to think, like, we've kind of been working at this 
like, with you guys completely out of the loop. And I, I appreciate that, but it, it wasn't, I guess it wasn't us, our permit to bring in, we were uh, just kind of like, thank yeah, you yeah. for inviting us to the table, right? <laughs> and so, uh, to, to be clear, yeah. I, I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but I'm personally thankful that you didn't, um, we haven't had to be, along, at the end, yeah. be along for the ride yet, but I feel like we're getting close to, yep. um, a, you know, being looped in where and when appropriate. Yes. That's all. I get. Great. Other comments? I'll be very brief because I'm tired. Um, hey, July 1 came, and we have a new energy conservation code in effect. And Scarborough being over 4,000 people, it's a mandatory enforcement. Lots of good things coming. You'll hear me. Just so you know, we're, I'm not making stuff up when I'm talking to these folks about, you know, not bringing in natural gas or stuff. The whole push is decarbonizing. Uh, these buildings and every time we have combustion in these buildings we're adding you know greenhouse gas and we all know uh, scientists have given us miles and miles of data about greenhouse gas and the effects it's having so Maine's moving in the right direction and I'm very excited that we have a comp plan uh, uh, an updated comp plan that has a lot of fantastic um, roadmaps for us uh, there's a lot of committee work that's going to happen, you know, uh, to, to get everything in place, but it's, it's very exciting. And then finally, whoever had the downs make the innovation uh, print that was in our packet this week that laid things out, I really appreciate that. It really helped get a sense of what's going on, um, and I'll be anxious to find out what's going in that big lot. <laughs> Thank you. And I will be anxious to know uh, when we're going to see some movement in the lots along Payne Road. I think uh, as the economy starts to recover more and more from COVID, uh, there may be more, more interest there. Um, in terms of workshops, I, I think facing us, we're going to need several of them. Um, certainly for the uh, traffic movement, the traffic changes, I think for that large lot, uh, we're going to need a workshop. I, I think when we have a full board uh, with uh, two new alternates, about three or four years ago, and I'm not sure that you two were on the board at that time, but I know Roger and I were, we did a workshop at which the town attorney came and talked to us. Uh, and it was very helpful and be very helpful for a review, and especially for new folks, it's very helpful uh, for them to understand the scope of, of the board. Now, uh, Maine Municipal puts on their workshop, um, but Scarborough has uh, ordinances that, that do go beyond a lot of towns uh, and in terms of protecting its environment uh, and its people and its design standards. And uh, what we can do is a, what's called a quasi-judicial body. Uh, and what we can't do, so it's probably time for that as, as a review. I've also asked Jamel just to keep an eye out for any workshops that may be coming up <clears throat> through the Maine Municipal Association or other associations out there that board members might be interested in. Uh, I've taken some through Maine Municipal Association in terms of running meetings, in terms of um, equity, uh, in terms of outreach to the community, uh, they've been they've been helpful, uh, and it's been very good to hear what other towns are doing. So uh, there is an opportunity for board members to uh, it, request to go to a workshop um, if the town deems it's within the scope of what we're working on. I hope hopefully the town would pay for it, uh, and That's if it's correct. Good. And if it's something separate that you just look at and say, gee, I would really like to know about that, um, because we are, because Scarborough is a member of the Maine Municipal Association, we are entitled to a discount as individual members of the planning board. So you can register and ask for the uh, Scarborough discount. Uh, and um, that's what I've done with some of the trainings that simply have been interesting to me. Uh, so I'm I think uh, uh, Jamel and uh, Doreen are going to have to get out some 
information to us or request from us on what our calendars look like. It's possible that we may have to take a look at an occasional Saturday as I see uh, some, of, some of the work coming up. Uh, and I know that the planning board members are on other committees. Uh, it could be that our, our evenings get really overloaded. Uh, and it might be easier to try to do two workshops on a Saturday morning um, than find time in the evening to do those two workshops. But um, we'll see what that looks like. We'll see how many we're going to need. But I think uh, our work is going to um, start expanding. Uh, I think from what uh, Rocky said and Dan said in terms of what's coming down from the town center, we're going to start seeing that. We will certainly need a workshop, I, I suspect, as soon as we get what's going on with the town center, we get those recommendations. So we, we have a lot of basic groundwork that we need to take a look at. Uh, it's exciting. Um, it's also going to be a lot of work. Um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it because uh, we can see I think now the real difference that's that's going on in this town. And when I read something, for instance, about Cape Elizabeth having a problem with uh, developing workforce housing uh, <coughs> on their main street, I'm thankful that uh, in Scarborough uh, we have a community that's interested in workforce housing and affordable housing and senior housing uh, and a clean environment. So we, we are both lucky and tasked with uh, quite a great deal of responsibility. And it's coming up, and it's coming on us pretty fast. And I think that's it. Anything else? I think there's a motion to adjourn. I, I heard one. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, just raise your hands. And Doreen will record that as unanimous. Thank you. <laughs>